Kicking off our list at number 10, Western Camel Bones. Scientific name being Camelops hesternus, meaning yesterday's camel in Latin. There's a fun fact. Now these bones first appeared in 2008 when gold miners were working in Hunter Creek. It was only 60 miles away from the Alaskan border. When all of a sudden they stumbled across these massive bones, ancient bones. The last time these bones were operating on, you know, actual limbs, was 75 to 125,000 years ago. Isn't that incredible? The remains were in such great condition because of the awful surrounding conditions. It was so cold that scientists could actually still extract DNA, which told us that 10 million years ago, roughly, Western camels split from modern day camels. Yeah, we had more camels, now we don't have many camels. Sads. The more camels, the better. Number nine, Allen Hill's meteorite. All right, this one's for all the space nerds. This next one is literally out of this world. Back in December 1984, American meteor hunters discovered this fragment in Allen Hills, Antarctica. Now this meteor was appropriately named Allen Hills 48001, which is, okay, let's break to the point. Now this rock was speculated to come from Mars. And in 1996, a scientist claimed that he discovered bacteria from the microscopic fossils on this meteorite. Now the news of course spread quickly and everybody started to lose their minds. You know, rightfully so, this is a while ago. Bill Clinton even chimed in. He made a speech about possible discoveries in space with aliens and sh The scientific community later said this was not the case after further studies, but never say never. Feels like we're getting closer to finding life now with James Webb. I don't know, every time I click refresh, it's like, check out this thing that's in the past. I'm like, what? Number eight, more meteorites. For this one, we'll switch it up. This time, scientists found ice in meteorite. Nice, it's always a good time. James Webb is about to hopefully show us how much water is in space, and I personally am not ready for it. Back in 1990, after the 094 meteorite was discovered in the Algerian mountains, the rock was dated back to 4.6 billion years ago. So scientists studied the meteorite with synchrotron radiation-based X-ray nanotomography, leading scientists to find evidence of tiny pores. Pores believed to have been fossilized ice crystals. That's fun, that's, again, space aliens with water. Who knows, hopefully. These pores have come from when the meteorite crossed the snow line in space. Now the snow line is a sphere around the sun. It's the exact point where ice on meteorites melts. It's pretty cool. The study was to hopefully find out where water comes from in that galaxy, and it seems that it came from a lot further than we all thought, which is comforting, I guess. Yeah, there's water in space, it's just, you know, way the fuck out there. Number seven, viruses. We're all talking about an ancient virus that's coming back now, some ancient mummified frozen virus. Sounds like we're doomed. Just over a year ago in China, scientists discovered an ancient virus. These samples came from the Tibetan Plateau, and the samples were originally collected back in 2015. Now the contents date back to around 14,400 years ago, long before Captain America went into the ice. And there's dust, gases, and of course, viruses over that long accumulated time, and glaciers just soaked it all in, right? Layer after layer, pushing history deeper into its icy core until scientists come in with a few mega drills. Now we're finding dinosaurs, we're finding bones, and also, sometimes we find 33 viruses. Yeah, 33, that's like two more than my family computer had growing up. That's a lot of viruses. Four of these viruses typically infect bacteria and the rest were novel, which means that it's never been seen before. Yeah, how neat is that? Novel viruses, just what the world needs right now. Number six, Otzi the Iceman. Discovered in September 1991, this mummy was found on the border of Austria and Italy. He's Europe's oldest known natural mummy. It's pretty amazing. He was covered in ice shortly after his death, so most of the 45-year-old man from the Copper Age was left in rather good condition. A 5,000-year-old man was found in ice. You know, you lose this round, Captain America. Again, I'm just saying. I really thought I'd put you on this list. Not this time. Before we passed in the Italian Alps, Otzi had a number of health problems, it seems, that we've now found many years later. He had arthritis, Lyme disease, and he was lactose intolerant. Thanks to science, we now know that Otzi the Iceman was sharpening his tools right before his death. So, he fought till the end. What an OG. Number five, underneath Thwaites Glacier. We've seen some fascinating stuff here on B. You know, I do my best, specifically underwater footage. I know that gives us all the creeps. We love exploring the deeps for some reason, but in this next one, I couldn't believe, honestly. You're about to see footage from the bottom of an Antarctic glacier, so buckle up. This glacier is the size of Florida, so if it collapses at any point in our time, our sea levels could rise 10 feet. And in 2019, researchers drilled 2,300 feet through the middle of Thwaites Glacier. 
picture. Then they dropped a robot with a camera right down and they saw this. For the first time ever, we've now seen the grounding zone of Thwaites Glacier. Lead scientist Brittany Schmidt says this project is a dream come true, and I can't agree more. It's her walking on the moon moment, and I could not agree more. This feels like another universe, almost. This looks like the upside down. This is terrifying. There's only one meter of space between the bottom of the glacier and the rocky seafloor, so think about that when you sleep tonight. Number four. Message in a bottle. Back in 1959, a geologist named Paul Walker, no, not that one, not even close, he decided to bury a message in a bottle. And he wanted to make a lasting statement about climate change, so he put this frozen message underneath rocks near a glacier in 1959, and then cut to 2013, well, what do we find again? We find Paul Walker's message in a bottle. The message inside was measurements, and to be exact, it was the length from the exact point of the bottle to the edge of a nearby glacier. But by 2013, many, many years later, said glacier had shrunk down 200 feet, so now the glacier was much further. A lasting statement indeed, I would say. Good call, Paul Walker. Number three, Ice Age art. More ancient artwork, but this time we're going to the Colombian Amazon. Now the thing is, unlike other drawings found in the ceilings of tombs or anything like that, this frozen canvas stretches about eight miles. It's incredible. The paintings inside, they're even more impressive. Dating back to 12,000 years ago, these were made near the end of the last ice age. Thousands of paintings, by the way, not just a handful of arrows, nothing like that, just a huge canvas. These were found in 2017, so pretty recently, but it was only last year where they finally went public with these Arctic findings. Now the findings being, you know, paintings of elephants, massive of sloths, horses from the Ice Age, snakes, birds, deer, that kind of stuff. This is now one of the largest collections of rock art in South America. Yeah, pregnant women or the origins of the Ninja Turtles? I don't know, I'm on the fence, you tell me. Number two, the Glacier Girl. Now before you get worried, no, this next one is not a real person, this next one is a plane. A P-23 aircraft was discovered in Greenland surrounded in ice. Now during World War II in July 1942, six P-38 fighter planes were ordered to make an emergency landing in Greenland due to lousy weather conditions and of course low visibility. Now the crew was thankfully saved, but the Lockheed had to be abandoned never to be seen again for now 50 years. Recently, it was dug out of 264 feet of snow and ice. It took years to get this plane back up, but now she of course is known as the Glacier Girl, and in 2017, Lewis Energy CEO Rodney Lewis, he bought this plane. Yeah, they just brought a plane out of the ice, and this guy's like, yeah, I'll buy it, debit, no problem. And finally, number one, a preserved mammoth cub. In 2010, a mummified mammoth cub was discovered in Siberia, right off the coast of Oyogos, named after a nearby village, Yuka, this newfound cub, is now the best preserved mammoth cub discovered in history. Now this was a fascinating find that should have never been seen again, let alone found in such great condition. It's kind of haunting when you look at it, it still looks alive, you know what I mean? But apparently that's not the end of woolly mammoths. Who knew? It was announced only months ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a company called Colossal, they're now planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. For reasons, you know, for science reasons. The last mammoth to walk the planet alive was around 10,500 years ago, but what if they were alive today? Colossal raised over $15 million and now they're working on reviving that woolly mammoth. They're doing this to ideally decelerate the melting of the Arctic permafrost and to save modern elephants from extinction and of course to advance CRISPR editing. We love science, maybe a little too much, I don't know. Is it a good idea to bring the woolly mammoth back to life or are we just, I don't know, setting them up for another slow, horrible demise once again? Number 10, Titanic. <clears throat> I cannot conceive of any vital disaster happening to this vessel. Modern shipbuilding has gone beyond that. That was a quote from E.J. Smith. Who was that, you may ask? None other than the excellent Navy expert who was the captain of the Titanic. Oof. It would be very funny if not so ironic. Or maybe that's where the humor is. Regardless, the Titanic was a headline in the news even before it got wet in the ocean. The largest luxurious vessel ever constructed until now and it was unsinkable. Eh, I don't know about that. What modern times we live in where ships no longer sink? What modern times we live in where ships no longer sink? Well, if you've ever seen Leo smooch Kate Winslet in the back of your grandpa's car, then you know how well that went. The Titanic rests 13,000 feet below the ocean. Not too far from the rock bite. That's Newfoundland. Number nine, Chernobyl. If you've seen the HBO miniseries Chernobyl, then you have a very good understanding of just how terrifying this is. 
Chernobyl is the site of the Soviet nuclear power plant that in April of 1986 had a serious accident due to a flawed reactor design and staff that didn't really get the best training. The accident itself was explained really well in the show and at the trial that took place. But it resulted in a steam explosion and fires that released 5% of the radioactive core into the environment. The explosion ended two workers lives with acute radiation poisoning affecting a confirmed 123 people and ending 28 of those people's lives as well. Around 5,000 cases of thyroid cancer with 15 fatal incidents were probably caused by the radioactive iodine fallout. Look, it was not good. It was scary. And what was potentially even scarier was the way people tried to cover it up. Number 8. Berlin Wall Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. For the younger audience that doesn't know, let me break it down for you. After World War II ended, relations between the West and the Soviet Union broke down to the point of global destruction. Germany, having lost to all parties during the war, got split up. Capitalists and Communists. Trouble is, people living on the capitalist side were just living better. So people began flocking over to the better side. The Communist government decided to build a big, bad, grey, depressing wall, monitored by guards with orders to open fire if someone tried getting across with the proper documentation or reasoning. This went on for a few decades until one day in 1990, when the border crossing's red tape was cut and the wall began to come down brick by brick. That must have been something to watch, and I can imagine for those who got to witness it, they were glued to their television sets. Very cool. Cool history. Number 7. One Giant Leap As most humans know, we have gone to the moon. Unless you think it was faked, and in which case, please civilly discuss below. But after traveling 240,000 miles in 76 hours, Apollo 11, that's the 11th Apollo mission, entered into a lunar orbit on July 19, 1969. On July 20th, 1969, two men, American astronauts Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin, touched down for the first time in the history of the Earth on the surface of our moon. And then six hours later, they left their craft and stepped out onto the surface. They left a plaque and some footprints, erected some flags, ran some tests, bada bing, bada boom, and then they hopped back in the craft, had a little sleep, and departed on July 21st at 1.54 p.m. Earth time. And we've been back five more times since. Number 6. The Roswell Incident The Roswell Incident used to be the biggest event to ever happen in New Mexico history. Now it's being shadowed by a bald chemistry teacher, his science enthusiastic student, and a slimy lawyer. Who would have known? Well, for the second most eventful uh, event to ever come out of New Mexico was the Roswell Incident. A mysterious flying object, other known as a UFO, crashed into the desert. Naturally, in the 1940s era US military, they kept secrets, the same way your mom holds on to family tea. Seriously, ask her about that one family member. She's going to tell you something you don't want to know. This secrecy quickly spread rumors of it being an alien from outer space. Well, it wasn't until the 90s that this incident was officially declassified and declared to be nothing more than a weather balloon. Or at least that's what we were told. This didn't stop the town of Roswell, New Mexico, however, from adopting this alien rumor into the town's very fabric. To this day, the little green man can be found in Roswell as sort of a tourist attraction. Every town needs something. Mm, take me to your weeder. Take me to your weeder. <laughs> Number five, Private War Bear. It wasn't just members of the human species who took part in WW2. No, sir. Mules, dogs, pigeons, horses, bears. Bears? Soldiers in Poland had come across a bear cub on the side of the road whose mother had been unfortunately removed from this world by hunters. One of these soldiers decided he was going to raise the cub as his own and named him Wojtek. Wojtek was trained by this soldier and a civilian and eventually he was even enlisted in the Polish army so that he could legally come aboard a British transport ship. Fortunately, he didn't actually do any fighting but he was given his own paybook, serial number, and the rank of private. He would bunk up with other soldiers, loved beer and cigarettes, and helped transport supplies including heavy boxes of ammunition. Nice. Number 4. Rough Riders Okay, think about the toughest guy you know. Maybe it's your dad, maybe it's your uncle, maybe it's you. 
maybe it's me. No matter who it is, I bet they aren't as tough as Teddy Roosevelt, the 26th President of the United States. He was well known for being a man who enjoyed nature, the explorer's man if you will. Safari hunter, Nobel Peace Prize winner, soldier and a big booster for the national park system. The man did it all, but did you know that during a speech in 1912, President Roosevelt was shot? <gasps> Gasp. Now before I tell you what happened next, I want you to take a guess what happened next. Did he A, drop to the ground and perish, or B, the assassin was a lousy shot and missed, giving the president a chance to return fire? What's your answer? Type down below. Well, the answer was secret option C. I got you. He was shot and showed the crowd that he was. And then he said, I can no longer make a long speech because I have been shot, where he then continued to deliver an 82 minute speech. What a man. Number three, Pepsi Army. Did you know that the company Pepsi actually had the world's sixth largest military for a brief moment in time? Okay, so basically what happened is that Pepsi realized that they were inferior to Coca-Cola. And so they installed AI into their Pepsi cans worldwide, creating an autonomous army of soda cans. No, that's not what happened, you goof. Actually, in 1959, at an American exhibition, PepsiCo tried to prove the great concept of capitalism. Pepsi actually did a pretty good job. But the cash of the Soviet Union wasn't really accepted all over. So instead, the Soviets traded submarines, military ships, and a lot of vodka for tons and tons and tons of Pepsi. Enough that Pepsi ranked sixth among the world's military powers until it sold all of that. Number two, Emu War. Australia, land of sun, beaches, and spiders that got too buff. Too much for me. But today, we're talking about my friends from down under. Shout out to the Aussies. Chetty loves you. But we gotta talk about the Emu War, guys. What the heck was going on there? In a nutshell, emus were causing havoc in Australia's agriculture sector and destroying farms at an alarming rate. So the government said, Ron in, tight easy, get rid of the buggers. A couple of soldiers were given large automatic weapons to deal with the pests. Well, it didn't turn out very well as the emus just didn't seem to want to eat the bullets. Can you blame them? I can't. One Australian politician jested that the emus should be given medals for their bravery. In the end, the emus won. Number one. Free fallen. 50 years ago, on January 26, 1972, Vesna Volovi, a flight attendant from Serbia who worked for the Yugoslavian airline JAT, got on board JAT flight 367 to Copenhagen. Also on board that flight, unfortunately, was a device inside a briefcase that went boom over Czechoslovakia. While everyone else on board did not survive, Miss Volovic was stuck inside the shattered fuselage by a food cart as the plane and Vesna fell 33,000 feet. Thankfully, there were trees to break the fall and snow to cushion the landing near a small Czech village. But Vesna still suffered a skull fracture, broken legs, three broken vertebrae, she was temporarily paralyzed from the waist down, and put in a coma, leaving her with no memory of the flight or her descent. While there was some skepticism about the way the flight went down, she still received a Guinness World Record for the longest survived fall without a parachute. So that makes up for everything, right? Yeah. Number 10, Albert. Adam, how is Queen Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert bizarre? Well, my little honeybees, not to be a pessimist, but it's bizarre because they actually really did love each other. Uh? Be honest, how often do you think it occurred that people of royal or noble birth actually got to marry someone they genuinely loved? On February 10th, 1840, Queen Victoria married Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg Gotha, who, interestingly, was her first cousin and who was actually kind of not the favorite of the British people who saw him as an outsider. As queen, she was the one to propose. Good for you, queen. Literally. The couple stayed married for 21 years until Albert died of typhoid in 1861. And together, the couple had nine children. Nine. Even after his death, Queen Victoria continued to make ruling decisions based on the principle of what would Albert do? It's such a nice way to start this heinous list. Number nine, Napoleonic Wars. Okay, a little bit of a stretch, but I would argue the Victorian era lasted from about 1814 to 1914. There's no specific date, but it could be classified around this time. The Napoleonic Wars were essentially world wars started by one man. 
the Corsican Ogre. Hello. Imagine having the whole world against you. No, really, the whole world against you. Britain, Prussia, Russia, Austria, and sometimes Italy took part in the coalition wars, which were just part of Napoleon's story. Trust me, this dude was arrogant and he was the antagonist of the story. He's been labeled as the greatest tactician ever. When it was all said and done, he had rediscovered ancient Egypt, fought many battles, and managed to become emperor. And he got banished twice. Eight, mummy unwrapping parties. What is your favorite idea of a get together? Let me know down below, I won't judge, I promise. Unless, of course, you say mummy unwrapping parties like some people in the Victorian era might have. Then I will indeed judge you. Thanks to the Napoleonic Wars making their way to Egypt, interest in the country was on the up and up. And while people have been buying mummies since the Elizabethan era, now these rich weirdos bought even more, bringing them back as souvenirs. Once they got to the homestead, they would almost instantly hold parties with all their rich friends where they would unwrap their mummies like a Christmas present. Congratulations! It's exactly what you thought it would be! A five or six thousand year old decaying corpse that smells horrible. Why are rich people like this? I, I don't get it. Number seven, Fire Hazard Christmas. Like all families at Christmas, we all have our traditions. I'm a good boy all year, so Santa can bring me lots of gifts. Thanks, Santa. My family tradition is to watch the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation every year. I love that movie. Adam, on the other hand, well, he's a bad boy, and he eats all the chocolate out of his advent calendar before it's time. Don't tell him I said anything, though. I can't help it. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's right there. However, one family Christmas tradition was quite popular back in Victorian times, oftentimes called Snapdragon. Uh, the basis of this game was to get a large bowl, fill it with dad's brandy, and drop some large raisins in said bowl. Next, get a candle or a match and uh, light it up. Now that there's a large cauldron of flaming liquid and fireballs in your living room, now your objective is to try and knock the raisins out of the dish without getting burned. Fun for the whole family, why not? Just be mindful, you know, that the whole house is made of wood and there's no fire alarms and there's no modern firefighting equipment and everyone's wearing long gowns and you get the point. Number six, maybe we were apes? November 24th, 1859 marks the day that none other than Charles Darwin published the famous and even infamous On the Origin of Species, presenting his theory of natural selection and questioning the theory of creation. Truly a great day in my opinion. Look, we can talk evolution versus creation in the comments, but there is no denying the evidence presented in On the Origin of Species had people turning heads and questioning everything they thought they knew. Its full title, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life kind of explains it. But basically, Charles' book gave us the idea that species evolve over generations through the process of natural selection, which he backed up with evidence from the Beagle expedition in the 1830s, which to my disappointment had nothing to do with the dog breed beagles. Number five, the potato famine. The potato, so rugged, so versatile. Think of all the ways you can prepare a potato. Boiled, broiled, baked, mashed, pan fried, deep fried, french fries, hash browns, latkes, and sometimes you can put them in soup or stew. Usually pretty cheap and filling. The food of peasants and I love it. However, during 1845 Ireland, a fungus outbreak was taking hold of potato harvest all over the country. Thus creating a large famine that would see over one million people perish in a famine. Queen Victoria tried to help but was ineffective. And by help, I mean the same effort I put into reaching for the TV remote that's too far away on a lazy Sunday. Number four, body snatching. Look, back in the day, making a buck was not so easy. Some people who had absolutely no morals went this route. Basically, you wait around for a recently vacant grave to be not vacant. And before the soil can settle, you remove the inhabitant of said grave and go to your local university and say, Right, I've got this here fresh non-mangled corpse, give me some money and it's all yours. And Bob's your uncle, you are now the very bottom of the barrel, the tritus of human existence. But hey, you made some moolah and can afford to eat your next meal. Honestly, while you may be the worst of the worst people, it's partially the doctors and schools that are to blame for even accepting these fresh, illegally exhumed corpses for study in the first place. It may not sound like a specific event, but um, some people dressed up for it, so there's that. Number three, the chew, innit? 
The London Underground, baby, the world's first subway. Which, let me tell you, it's kind of annoying living in Canada when you have two very popular franchises that share two common names for a rapid underground train. Metro and Subway, right? It's so annoying. You Google Metro and Subway and then the grocery store comes? I never have that. Okay. It's, maybe it's that, a me thing. It's a me that's thing. Tunnels underneath the city and trains travel through it. It's simple. Well, the first one was opened in 1863, which is an engineering feat to say the least. And it feels like forever ago. I mean, that's older than Canada for crying out loud. When you think of the Victorian era, you think horses, carriages, top hats, and orphans asking for more gruel. Mind you, the locomotive was different from a modern one, but this is a very modern idea, especially considering that there's no cars yet. Kind of a weird thing. Number two, the telephone. On March 7th, 1876, Scotsman Alexander Graham Bell got a patent for his invention of the telephone. Three days after acquiring the patent, Mr. Bell made his first phone call to his assistant, Thomas A. Watson, saying, Watson, come here, I want to see ya. And that was that. And we've gone downhill ever since. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. The telephone is a huge groundbreaking invention allowing people to communicate across vast distances. But the phone addiction some of us have to deal with now, man, it's rough. Alexander Graham Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and the whole reason he became interested in the idea of creating the telephone was because of his mother, who was deaf, and his father, Alexander Melville Bell, who was a teacher of elocution, and was famous for the phonetic transcription system he had developed to help the deaf learn to speak, which is really quite sweet, actually. Number one, the war to end all wars. Out of all my research about the Victorian era, the start was somewhat muddy. Maybe because historians don't want to take away from North American or Napoleon history. But the end of the Victorian era was more clear. 1914, the war to end all wars. This was the big one, folks. A mixture of militarism, imperialism, alliances, and a power struggle uh, made for a powder keg that ended up exploding in 1914. Unlike a lot of wars, this one actually changed things. Empires fell while others got stronger. Countries on maps were being redrawn. Others stayed the same. The culture? Well, it changed too. What did it? I'm not sure exactly, but what I do know is that when sitting in a wet, freezing, muddy trench for months on end, well, that's horrible, especially when the only thing you have to look at is a red paste that used to be your comrades. It was not a good time. And it made a lot of folks go a little, you know, a little green. Number 10, Monica. There have only been three presidents to be formally impeached in the US. Andrew Johnson was the first. Most recent would be Donald Trump, twice, but the second would be none other than President Bill Clinton. In November of 1995, Mr. Clinton began to have a spicy little entanglement with 21-year-old unpaid intern Monica Lewinsky at the White House. But just like every decision to hit up a Taco Bell, that kind of thing always comes back to bite you. You think maybe this time will be okay, and then you're sweating on the toilet on the verge of tears. Monica began to tell her coworker Linda Tripp about the little affair she was a part of, and unbeknownst to Miss Lewinsky, Linda began to record it all. After another woman, Paula Jones, began to sue the president for sexual harassment, Lewinsky was subpoenaed, and things just went on a spiral of investigation that climaxed on December 19th, 1998, when Bill Clinton was charged with lying under oath to a federal grand jury and obstructing justice. But he finished his term, so. Number nine, Hindenburg. Flight! For many years, people have dreamed of flying with the birds in the sky. In the early 1900s, this became a reality. Air travel and machine design quickly developed over a short period of time. While today we are most familiar with airplanes, jets, and helicopters, there was another vehicle that was becoming a mainstay of military use and air travel. Blimps, or airships. After a brief use in World War I, they became something of a luxury. Long distance, smooth air travel. The issue? Well, they were kind of slow and prone to crashing, which is bad. What's the cause of these crashes? Well, to be exact, there's more than one, but the big issue or the big problem for these airships was that they were filled with hydrogen. Your 10th grade chemistry teacher will let you know just how flammable and dangerous that gas is. The Hindenburg airship crashed on a routine landing in 1937. All the humanity. Number eight, Oppenheimer. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The Hindu scripture that ran through the mind of J. Robert Oppenheimer when he first witnessed the devastation of the device he led the creation of on July 16, 1945. He was not wrong. 
Ever since Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the entire world knows the absolute world ending potential nuclear war could unleash. Oppenheimer was the leader of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, New Mexico beginning in 1942, which was basically meant to figure out how to use atomic energy for the military. They were successful enough that it directly led to Oppenheimer wanting to completely stop development. And when they wouldn't, he straight up resigned. Instead, he became chairman of the General Advisory Committee of the Atomic Energy Commission. And in October 1949, he opposed the development of the devices he helped create. This simple opposition led to him being labeled a communist supporter, suspended from secret nuclear research, and stripped of his security clearance by the Atomic Energy Commission. He wanted to help prevent the development of weapons that could bring on the apocalypse. Sometimes history makes me legitimately upset. Number seven, Mr. Yamaguchi. There are those that possess the power of ninjutsu. There are those that harness the power of titans. And there are those who transform from a Japanese schoolgirl into a schoolgirl with a sailor outfit and have the power of the moon. I, I don't know. Well, then there are those who possess the power to resist the apocalypse. Mr. Yamaguchi is a unique man. A man who survived not one, but two atomic detonations during World War II. The great part? He lived a long life, advocating for peace in a nuclear arms free world. The first initial blast left him with burns and hearing loss. When telling people of a survival story three days later, no one would believe him, as such a thing could not exist, right? Well, that's when the second detonation occurred. Heard. This time he was unharmed, and I'm sure people believed him that time. Number six, Obama. While it should not be unusual, it was, and it was groundbreaking. On November 4th, 2008, Barack Hussein Obama Jr. became the first African American president in the history of the United States of America and gave hope to millions of Americans that they too could achieve anything they wanted to. His father grew up in the Inyaza province of Kenya before going to Hawaii to study economics, where he met the future president's mother, Ann Dunham, from Kansas. As a former senator of Illinois, whose campaign slogan was change we can believe in and yes we can, Barack was elected to a second term over Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney in 2012. As president, Barack was the winner of the 2009 Nobel Peace Prize. He was responsible for the passage of the Affordable Health Care Act, the de-lifing of Osama bin Laden by SEAL Team 6, and the legalization of gay marriage by the Supreme Court. Nice. Number five, Violet Jessup. Miss Unsinkable. What if I told you that Miss Jessup was a survivor of the Titanic, Britannic, and the Olympic? I know, right? The Titanic should need no introduction. It always has been and will be immortalized by a James Cameron movie. But you may not know that the Titanic had sister ships, the Britannic and the Olympic. Miss Violet Jessup was a nurse on all three. The Titanic hit an iceberg and sank, of course. The Britannic hit a sea mine and sank. The Olympic had a fender bender with another ship, but uh, that one didn't sink. Just kind of a, just a little bit of damage to the hull, but it made it back to shore, so that's, that's good. Now, I'm not superstitious or anything like that, but the odds and luck of finding yourself on three of the largest vessels and surviving all of those three catastrophes? I don't know. Bad omen or good luck charm? Maybe just stay off that line of cruisers. Regardless, she is remembered as Miss Unsinkable and for her bravery in all scenarios, especially the Britannica. A severe head injury didn't even stop her. You go, girl. You go. Number four, Amelia Earhart. Almost everyone has heard of her at some point in their lives. Amelia Earhart's disappearance somewhere over the Pacific in July of 1937 is one of the world's greatest unsolved mysteries. Amelia Earhart was a female American aviator who set a literal ton of records and pushed for women advancing in aviation. She was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic and the first to fly solo from Hawaii to the mainland. She served as a Red Cross nurse's aide in our home of Toronto during World War II and would spend her time watching pilots in the Royal Flying Corps train while hanging out there. She was the first woman to receive the Flying Cross's military medal awarded for heroism or extraordinary achievement while participating in an aerial flight. But it was in 1937 when she would try and fly around our lovely blue and green globe and would disappear into legend. Number three, refuse espionage. All right, folks, this is a new one for me. So during the Cold War, the eastern half of the world was cozying up to this brand new thing called communism. What? What's that? And what's better than that? The two major superpowers in the east were now both communist and cozying up to each other like Lenin in a Marx book by an open fire. Naturally, this made the west and America sweat. Make me sweat too. A lot of things do. It was concerning to say the least. Russia and China, socialist best friends. Everything was just 
peachy, except that Stalin did not exactly trust Mao. So to learn more about his new best friend, he had spies manipulate some things and uh, was going to judge what kind of a leader he was off of a stolen stool sample. Yes, you heard that right. For example, a lack of potassium in your refuse could be related to something of a nervous disposition, not the kind of qualities you want in your dictator best friend. Kind of like reading astrology, but from the sewer. Number two, movies. Going to the movies, the smell of popcorn, awkward first dates, and memories of sticky floors with no explanation. I love going to the movies, but it wouldn't be possible without the invention of the cinematograph and the Lumiere brothers, Louis and August. Louis Lumiere's Cinemagraph, which patented in 1895, was a combination movie camera and projector that would display moving images on a screen for an audience. The Cinematograph was smaller, lighter, and used less film than the Kinetograph and Kinetoscope, invented by Thomas Edison. And in 1896, the brothers opened up the first theaters called cinemas to show what they made. They sent camera crews around the world to shoot new material. Did not take long for this tech to travel, though. America opened its first cinemas in New Orleans the same year. In 1909, we got our first film review from the New York Times, the first Hollywood film studio in 1911, and Charlie Chapman started his career in 1914. And now we have mega corporations that pump out blockbusters monthly. Nice. Number one, Elvira, Elvira. So smart, this one, honestly, so five-head. So back in World War II, Germany went on tour. The tour included soldiers, ships, planes, and tanks. Mechanization, baby, nice. It's what we do. Now, any dad out there that's been doing small engine repair in the garage will tell you that sometimes a motor comes along that just stumps you. No matter how long you work on her, she just doesn't want to start. Only if you had a handbook to describe her inner workings. But you lost the manual years ago in the spring cleaning of 98. Ooh, sorry. Well, German soldiers had that manual, and to make them pay attention to said manual, there was illustrations of a gorgeous woman named Elvira who, on a lot of pages, would be missing parts of her clothing and or in revealing positions. So the equation goes, tough engine repair plus book of knowledge multiplied by a pretty cartoon lady equals paying attention. What about the engine again? Kick it off the list at number 10, Black Cats. Yeah, we'll start this dark list off a little slowly. You know, we'll ease our way into the witch trials. You see a black cat cross in front of you, what's the first thing you think? Bad luck, bad omens, bad stuff? Does that cat belong to anyone? Maybe I should take it home and take care of it. Well, in 1232, Pope Gregory IX, he exposed a cult of witches in Northern Germany. Yeah, he wrote an expose called Vox in Rama. He went in deep. He knew some of the ritual words used at these cult meetings. He knew everything, which in my opinion, a little fishy, right? This guy knows a lot. Were you involved, my dude? What's going on? He exposed the happenings, including the involvement of one black cat. They would oddly kiss it and worship it. Now, at first, when reading about this, I was like, oh no, the cat, what's gonna happen? No, it's good. It was cat worship in this way, which is odd, but better historically. The Pope did afterwards send hunters out to eliminate any cat in sight, so it is pretty dark and scandalous. The level of cats in the mid 1200s was almost at an extinct level. Pretty horrible, right? If only we had all those cats later on in 1347 when, you know, rats carrying the Black Death arrived. We definitely could have used a few cats, but eh, witches. Number nine. Flat Earth? Okay, it's 2022. We can watch live footage right now from the International Space Station just whipping around us. We can fly to Australia in this day and age. We can have a window seat and watch the entire commute. But there's still a good amount of people today that believe that the Earth is flat. How shocking is that? How scandalous indeed. The same guys who believed women were witches were also like, Oh, of course the Earth isn't flat, that's crazy. How conflicting is that historically? We think any time before Columbus, especially back in the Dark Ages, we have this general idea that they didn't know anything, specifically the scale of the planet or even the universe for that matter. We're still launching telescopes into space to record the edges of the galaxy. There's so much we don't know today, yet there's still flat Earthers. Shocking enough, the Middle Ages didn't see many of those. In the 13th century, navigators were regarding the Earth as a sphere, with four cardinal points as well, even going back Further, looking at ancient Roman days in 77 AD, Pliny the Elder, the ancient philosopher, also agreed on the Earth's shape. It was common knowledge, dare I say, even in the Dark Ages. So if you know any flat earthers, send them this link. And then also send them a link of the ISS. I don't know. Number eight, red hair problems. All right, if you're a redhead out there, I'm sorry about this one. I had to, I had to talk about it. History can be ugly sometimes, and more often than not, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Historically, urine has been used for the greater good. Teeth whitening, Roman laundry days, urine makes leather soft. 
We get it. The Spanish Inquisition brought with them the idea that red hair was a sign of witchcraft. Yeah, the sign of the devil himself. The manuscripts published at that time about redheads too didn't help. They were horrible. The Proverbs of Alfred warns against having a redhead as a friend. And then another manuscript, Secretum Secretorum, warns against using redheads as advisors. Yeah, not even a work friend. Sorry, Big Chad. Ooh. 14th century manuscripts tell me that you're working for the devil, so now we can't talk to you, all because you have nice hair. Another manuscript from the 14th century believes that redheads are rarely faithful in both friendships and romantic relationships. Yeah, if you have a redhead partner, don't go through their phone, okay? Don't listen to the Spanish Inquisition, okay? Don't listen to the devil. They're not working for the devil, okay? They're, they're just fine, they're, they're, they're redheads. Freckles as well, if you had freckles in the Middle Ages, Good game. Number seven, Macbeth's curse. Every curse starts somewhere, okay? All you theater kids out there probably know about this one. I feel guilty talking about this, here we go. There's a few things you can't say to an actor before a show, and oddly enough, good luck is one of them. Yeah, you're supposed to say break a leg. All these theater traditions you can't break, okay? You're about to go on and do Shakespeare, and do like this huge monologue wearing funky shoes. You gotta be in the zone, okay? You gotta, you know, it's like game day. Even actors have their playoff beards, you know what I mean? It's like a ritual, you gotta stick to it. This legend goes back to 1606, the time of Macbeth's first performance. The actor playing Lady Macbeth died right before the show, sadly, so Shakespeare had to step in and play the part himself. Now apparently at this time, a coven of witches cursed the show. Yeah, since then there's been tales of real daggers being used in the show accidentally instead of prop daggers. The Astor plays Riot in New York City back in 1849. That was caused by rival actors both playing Macbeth in their respective productions. There's also countless amount of stories recalling botched performances of the play, but what do we think? Is this the case of being in your own head and we just never dropped it, or is the Macbeth curse real? I don't know. COVID of witches cursing plays. That sounds pretty pretty medieval. I hope it's not real. That would suck. I just got cursed. Number six, witches curse. Ah, more curses. Let's do it. From the 1400s to the 1700s alone, there were around 50,000 individuals who were all found guilty of witchcraft and wizardry. And we all know what that meant. But how many of those were actual witches? Like, really? Was this a real thing? Were any of them actually found guilty? Was any of them the red woman from Game of Thrones? Like, you know... Was, did she do anything? We'll start with a woman named Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, AKA Ursula Southiel. She was a clairvoyant from the 16th century, England's greatest, if that. Her mother as well was a widely known uh, witch which is a little dark. But Ursula, she was good at her job. She was often compared to Nostradamus. So she was using her passed on abilities for the greater good. Again, greater good. The middle age, greater good. She predicted the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, and she also predicted the internet. Yeah, in the 16th century, she predicted that thoughts around the world shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. It rhymes, so you know she was on a good streak. Mother Shipton actually passed away a peaceful death, believe it or not. She wasn't hunted down by a mob or anything like that. She was actually buried on unholy grounds in 1561, which is insanely bizarre for a witch at any time. And the fact that people compared her to Nostradamus and she wasn't, you know, Shocking. Dare I say, we have a good one. A nice good one for a halfway point. Number five, Agnes Sampson. And now back to the dark stuff. This one's not as great. Turning the clocks now to 30 years after Mother Shipton, the general public isn't always so easy when it comes to clairvoyance. So around 1590, when King James VI, when he was ruling Scotland, this was an important time because the lovely Anne of Denmark, Norway, his wife, she was very much opposed to black magic or all that voodoo. She wasn't on board at all. During one commute back to Scotland, for example, the couple barely made it through a fierce storm. So King James VI, he was now convinced, because of his wife, that the storms were an outcome of black magic. Yeah, a witch cursed their commute. All because of a storm, they thought this, imagine that. So they charged one Agnes Sampson. The king and the queen all believed that these witches attended a coven on Halloween night, and that's what happened with their commute. So she was held prisoner until she confessed. And then at that point, she finally met her horrible fate. Her nonsensical, horrible fate. Number four, Plague Bear. Okay, if you think your job sucks, Hear me out. The hot summer of July 1665. Okay, what do we do with all these poor souls who have been hit by said plague during the dark ages? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time, right? We can't just hide them in a random place. We don't have that. So a plague bear is the person that you need. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s. But when the plague hit, they had to change things up a bit. Now things were a little bit dangerous. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. Plague bearers, that's crazy. A church would then house these plague souls far away from society. How grim is that? All because you got sick. But I mean, that's probably a good thing, all things considered, you know? Is anything we learned in the past couple years, it's like, oh yeah, things uh, spread. 
Just a little bit, including misinformation. Ha <laughs> ha. Number three, medieval barbers. A barber from the Middle Ages. Yeah, that title alone gives me the chills. If I have a toothache, I'm telling no one. That appointment's gonna suck, okay? Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped the tooth, whatever. They would only pull it. Worst case, best case, your teeth are getting pulled no matter what. Yeah, barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. The classic three-in-one appointment. Get it all done in 40 minutes or less. There you go. Keep the change, good sir. And a thing of ale. There you go. Get drunk, pull my teeth. Middle Ages. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, right? Instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it the opposite way, the arrow remover would cut into the injury, open it more, which would suck, and then it would hold it open. And then the barber would come in and then pull it out in his own barber way. Whatever his qualifications were, it didn't really matter. He was a barber, he was also pulling arrows out of your back. So, <laughs> you would go in for a toothache and then you'd leave with an amputated foot. You never know, medieval barbers. Sucked all the time. Number two, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort, I can't believe this is a real thing that real people did. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare they, how dare thou? Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with all of this shit. There was the first standard ducking stool, so women would have to, you know, sit in this chair, strap themselves down while sitting outside their houses or, you know, whatever. They get carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. That was the main key here, where you'd, you know, come out and go, shame, shame for 46 minutes and then go back inside. That was your day back in medieval times. They had sex. Can you believe that? It's disgusting. Let's take the day off work and embarrass them and make signs. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was then dunked into a river over and over again to cool her immoderate heat. Yeah, we gotta cool these witches down. Great. I wonder where all these people, like, did they not realize where they came from? This is the dumbest shit. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Mission says. They should cool off all of those angry villagers instead. They should dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody over here is getting some and they're not. Number one, meowing nuns. If I'm not gonna talk about this one now, then I'm not sure when I'll get the chance to talk about it again. Back in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns were doing their, you know, COVID nun thing, as so many people did, apparently, back in. And this was odd in the Middle Ages, just because these nuns would have meowing sessions. Yeah, they wouldn't curse individuals, they wouldn't curse any long sea voyages. No, they would just gather around and meow all at the same time. The French coven, large, might I add, many of nuns here, they would spend hours meowing, like, in sync. They'd be like, meow. It would annoy nearby civilians so much that eventually soldiers had to come in and just beg them to stop. They're like, please, stop meowing. I don't know why you're meowing, but please stop. For most of these cases, most likely not witchcraft. This one here with the meowing nuns, I don't know. I think that was actually, something was afoot. That was actually a curse. Either that or it's the greatest prank in history. Either way, we have to finish on a nice happier note, dare I say. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Battle of Hastings. Okay, we look back at jesters and jugglers of the Dark Ages, and we laugh. We chuckle a little bit, rightfully so. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. It was one of the best jobs to have, despite how, you know, Game of Thrones made jesters look. It was an honorable job. The fool's payment also was no joke, my friend. Roland Le Petour was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II, so long as he kept farting and juggling. Not, not a bad gig. Don't let looks deceive you, however. During the Battle of Hastings in October 1066, it had one of the most badass minstrels I have ever heard of. No jokes with this guy, that's for sure. Now, for starters, this was the same battle where William the Conqueror defeated King Harold. Historic, of course. One of the bloodiest battles in history. How it all began, though. William's minstrel, his fool, sang at English troops while he was juggling his sword around. He was singing, he was doing a little show. He's juggling and saying some probably nasty things. That's when an English soldier came forward to challenge Taylor Fair, and then he was promptly killed. And so began one of the bloodiest battles in history. Yeah, he taunted them until they made the first move. Is that allowed? I'd be so upset. I'd be upset. Number nine, Malin Matt's daughter. On part one, we had a few cases where women were found guilty of practicing witchcraft. Of course. Now, this was a common theme for the Dark Ages, sadly, but it's one thing for a town to randomly turn against you out of the blue because they're spooked, whatever the case, but imagine your family, someone who actually knows you. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow, and her own daughter told everybody in town that she was a witch. Yeah, she was the last victim of the Great Swedish Witch Hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Mm, no way, she's like, nope, I'm not a witch. That's it. 
She didn't cry out in pain, she didn't beg for forgiveness, anything like that. She said it was all hogwash and she stood by it quietly. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so she too met a similar fate. Don't talk smack about your mothers. Number eight, toilet trouble. What a transition. Here on Bumblebee, we've talked a lot of smack about ancient toilets. God, they were so bad, I can't. I, I would never, I would hold it for 36 years. Apparently these things could also take lives, yeah. In the middle of the summer, nobody around you, you could have been a victim to a medieval toilet. Yeah, how does that happen? Let's talk about it. In 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan, he went out to the cesspit and the guy sadly fell in. Now normally you could just crawl back out, sure, but this fateful day, Duncan was quite intoxicated. Poor guy suffocated in his own, what a horrible way to go out, one of the worst ways to go out. Number seven, pole vaulting. This is one of the most impressive sports to exist. We do not talk about pole vaulting enough. Pole vaulting is insane. Just guy with a stick over a building, are you kidding? That's, that's Mario physics. Today we admire athletes like Sweden's Armand Mondo Duplantis. This guy broke the world record at the 2020 Olympics. He leaped over six meters with a stick. Back in the dark ages, however, this was not a sport. No, this was your commute. The day pole vaulting was born was supposedly Christmas Day, December 25th, 1521. A Christmas miracle. Now we have pole vaulting. A laborer named Robert Baker was heading home from the church. It was Christmas, he was tired. He decided to take a shortcut over a pond, so he grabbed a long pole and Voila, he just made it. Now, don't try this. We don't recommend this as a travel option, obviously, because later on, Baker's pole ended up snapping mid-leap and then he ended up drowning, sadly, yeah. The poor guy bridged to Terabithia himself, so I wouldn't recommend pole vaulting. Number six, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the iron throne, although I'm sure that seat isn't quite comfortable either. I have a funny back, you know, I have to, I gotta sit, ooh. That's where we go. Who to crack in the mic? The iron chair was a device used in medieval punishments. Yeah, it sounds crazy to say it, but this one seems more tame compared to some of the other devices used, you know? Like I mentioned the ducking stool in part one. That was, that was bad. This one's more Viking. This one's actually pretty brutal. These spikes don't look like much upon first glance, but they easily can poke through your skin. The chair is actually designed to pierce through the skin without hitting any vital organs. So you had to sit still. Definitely had to sit still. You know, I actually lied to you guys. The more I explain this one, the more I think it's the worst of the worst. I guess this is why they call it the Dark Ages. Oh my gosh. Number five, Bridget Bishop. In 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and then in result, you would get covered in these sores, like pimple-like bubbles. It was horrible, it was really painful. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the fine people of Salem thought, no, they're probably witches. I think they're, I think they're witches who can float and do magic, for sure. That seems more realistic, right? Yeah, for sure. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of this disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, obviously being, you know, extremely ill. The village doctor, William Greggs, just said at this point that they were bewitched. He's like, uh, here's a word. And they're like, great, that did nothing. He's like, okay. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, well, that's how science works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch. The reason they kicked off this entire Salem witch hunt was Bridget Bishop and her sickness. So over the next few months, around 150 more were convicted, all meeting their similar horrible fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop, or maybe it was just rye disease. Yeah, who would have thunk? Now it's referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions, everything's similar. It feels like there's bugs under your skin, which is the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life. But these doctors didn't know that at the time. Everyone thought they were all just cursed, which is, they were not cursed. They just needed help. It's really just that. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly ended. Huh, weird. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they just run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter, it's probably the latter. Number four, steal. Don't steal, please. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody back in the medieval days, imagine proving that you're innocent, that you didn't just steal an apple and run it through a village, right? It's also really tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras. It was literally like Assassin's Creed. Just throw your hood up, grab an apple, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and hope for the best. Hope an arrow doesn't go on the way out. That's really it. 
The markup for stealing was also pretty wild for the time. It kind of had to be. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times that whatever you stole. So you better be a track star. You better have one of those pool vaults handy, my friend. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft. It wasn't all the same. So you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Sometimes, maybe, depends. Again, I'm talking about a time where people believed in witches. People who made ducking stools. They made fun new methods for punishing one another. So, you know, who's to really say? But depending on where you got caught, you might lose a body part or you might just get a slap on the wrist. The reality is, more often than not, anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. Number three, coffins. Now when you hear the word coffin, odds are you're thinking of vampires or you know, some dude like this in a wooden box, uncomfortable. Coffins in the medieval times are a little bit different. They're outside the front of the castles, these cages, they're usually, you know, hanging off of some dainty like street light looking thing. Usually a crow is pecking away at a skeleton. It's haunting. Those cages are coffins. The victim was placed inside said cage and the period of time they're kept there depends on your crime. Now of course people were left there to die a lot but instead of sharp metal or a rusty chair people would burn in the sun and then starve to death until animals or birds finished them off. But here's the kicker. Yeah it gets worse believe it or not. While these coffins would be placed in open hot areas a lot of the time more often than not they would be placed in public areas. So crowds would gather, they would talk and then throw stuff at the victim while they were serving their time day after day. Even though you weren't sentenced to death, the town may just vote otherwise. Number two, animal witches. Okay, if you have any pets watching this video, get them out of the room. Cover their little fluffy ears for this. I don't want them getting any ideas. One of the craziest things about looking back to the Salem witch trials has to be that animals were also found guilty of witchcraft. Yeah, like a pig went to trial actual court. Grown adults would show up for animals. I'm dead serious. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and wizardry. Yep, I wonder what house this pig would belong into. I vote Slytherin. No better sous chef than a golden retriever, in my humble opinion. But to be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so you know, it could have happened. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused, as well as two dogs. That's unbelievable. These villagers, their mindset was, if their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Why of course, why else? What are they, hungry or thirsty? Pfft, no, they're for sure witches. Villagers believed witches traveled at night, not by broom per se, but by riding on the back of their pets. Yeah, it wasn't just dogs either. They thought that witches rode cows, pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. She would be so late to that cauldron cook-off. And finally, number one, Giles Corey. So after part one and now part two, we can safely conclude that the Salem witch trials were a bunch of bull Yeah, a bit of a, a bit of bogus, I'd say. Out of the 27 people who had their lives taken away from them during the 1692 trials, 19 were hanged, 17 passed away in prison while serving their sentence, you know, being a witch and all. But the very last victim, Giles Corey, he refused to plead either innocence or guilty, and the law at the time states that you can't be tried otherwise. So they had to try and punish it out of Giles. They had to try and get him to confess so that they can take his land. Yeah, they used brutal measures as well. They laid a heavy board on top of the 81-year-old Giles Corey, and then over the course of two days, boulders were slowly added, making the weight more and more unbearable. They were hoping at this point that Giles would admit something, but every time they asked him anything about being a witch, Giles responded with the same sentence. He just responded with, more weight. Yeah, keep him coming, he says. What a champ. After two days of this punishment, this excruciating pain, Corey did in fact pass away still in full possession of his estate, which then went to his son-in-law. Now, if he had been found guilty, the government would have taken that from him. So he sadly did the best thing he could have long-term for his family at this point by not admitting. I mean, he had to deal with some of the dumbest and most cruel people that ever walked Salem. It's, it's pretty much just that, nothing to do with Giles or his choices. It's just, hey, check out how insane this town was. Yep, that's history. Number 10, unproud history. Blame it on my Canadian education, dyslexia, or me just being an idiot, but it took me three times to read over properly Moogle instead of Mongol. Moogle, Mongol, Moogle, Mongol. It also took me a second to realize that I'm talking about India, not Mongolia. It's okay, folks. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna drink some water and touch some grass. I'll be okay. <laughs> yes, the Mughal Empire. As it turns out, my confusion is semi-appropriate, as the Mughals were descendants of the mighty Kangas Khan, hence the Mongols. Makes a lot of sense now that you think about it. 
Turgic Mongols to be exact, the Mughals were well aware of the Mongols' reputation and their history. Let's just say they weren't too proud of it. Eh, you can't blame them. However, they were more proud of their Tamir sided heritage. Honestly, like I said, you can't blame them. It's kind of like your dad's side of the family, you know? They're okay, but everyone likes mom's side better. That's just how it goes. Number nine, Might of Ahoms. The Galactic Empire, the NCR, and the Mughals. What do all these large organized militaries share in common? They can all be defeated by a bunch of scruffy looking ragtags who spend too much time on mentats and in their X-Wings. All sci-fi jokes aside, the Ahoms were a tribal people who happened to live in the wrong neighborhood per se. Thing is, these guys had some serious grit. As in when dueling against the mighty Mughal Empire, they were not victorious once twice or three times, but a total of 17 times. 17, that's a lot. At a certain point, you've got to respect a group for kicking your butt that many times. At some point, you just got to throw the towels. Hey, let, let, let them keep the land. They can have it. It's theirs. I don't, I don't need it. I don't want it. Number eight, smoke. Love it or hate it. Smoking has been a part of life for a long time. Longer than you might think, actually. No, not the age of Marlboro Cowboys and ads later telling you not to. No, hacking a dart of the past was a little bit different than getting mad at the Leafs when they're losing and you're having a break outside. Interesting enough, however, it's speculated that the hookah, or the shisha, was invented by one of the Emperor's top doctors of the time. Naturally, this was something saved for the elite because, well, you can't have peasantry damaging their lungs, come on. They might need those bad boys after all, with all the work they do and stuff. Number seven, science and big booms. We've come a very long way in history, some might say too far. We've got cars, computers, and depending on who you ask, we've been to the moon. I say we have, it just makes sense. Come on guys. I mean, come on, obviously we have, because the moon is made of cheese, and that's where we get cheese, right? That's that's where we, that's what my mom said, we used to be cheese from there, right? Well, there certainly was no rocket ships back then, but the scientific advancement is what is to note here. The Mughal Empire was a big contributor of the Islamic scientific revolution, as there were many contributions in math, algebra, and other useful inventions. They were one of the first to use black powder. What does that mean? Uh, besides fireworks, it means blam blams. And if you know history or anything about the time period, you know how important blam blams are. Part of the uh, black powder empires, as they're called. Number six, Taj Mahal. Husbands and wives. Marriage. Beautiful marriage. The whole sanctimony that brings lovers together. Now, I'm sure all of our viewers at home will agree in saying marriage was the best thing they ever did and absolutely not a training experience after 15 years. Right guys? Shah Jahan would agree with that. The mighty emperor who went great lengths for his beloved wife. Now I'm sure you know this story, but in case you don't, this was the man that was so heartbroken from his wife's passing, so distraught that he built the Taj Mahal. That's like your partner at home saying, you know what, babe, I love you so much. Bam, there's the Empire State Building. There it is, look at it, that's for you. The Taj Mahal is the crown jewel of Mughal architecture, and at the time cost around $1 billion with our inflation. Every year, the Taj Mahal brings thousands of tourists to witness its ivory beauty. It is a beautiful building, can't, can't lie about that, but a billion dollars? <sighs> Man, she must, you must have loved that woman. Must have loved her, god dang. Number five, the Queen of India. So this massive and powerful empire, why is it not around anymore? I mean, in reality, we just don't do the whole empire thing anymore, unless you're Heisenberg, because he's in the empire business. But what's the main reason why they're not around anymore? Do you hear that? It's the Queen's Navy coming to shore, and the boats are chock full of redcoats. Look out, India, they're coming for your tea. Unfortunately for those living in India and the Mughal Empire at the time, this was sort of like the beginning of the end. As some years later, India would be brutally forced into one of the many colonies of the British Commonwealth. And yeah, did I mention brutal? Because it was pretty brutal. It wasn't the nicest of occupations the British ruled over for many, many years until a certain peace-loving Gandhi came years later and set the record straight. Number four, relatable. King Akbar of the Mughal Empire was a very notable leader, but today I'm talking about him for some other reasons. One that I can relate to personally. No, I'm not a secret king and have a palace of my own full of servants, although, I mean, if you guys want to pay me king, I wouldn't say no. It's well noted that Akbar was illiterate, which for royalty was rare back then, since that's usually the only people who can read or are allowed to read. Can't have the peasantry being too smart now, can't have that. However, some historians suggest that his literacy isn't to blame for a lack of trying, but it's dyslexia. 
Yeah, that's right. It's the same reason why I hated reading as a kid. And in high school, sorry, English teachers, you can just Google Cliff Notes. It's the future. Akbar, however, did not have Cliff Notes. He had the option to hire artists to illustrate beautiful works of art in order to comprehend some things that needed visualization since he couldn't read. I did not possess such powers. However, still still up to date. You know, if you guys want to make me king, that's fine. I'm okay with it. Number three, cholera belts. Okay, this one is just too weird not to mention. So in the end of the Mughal Empire, there were lots of British around. That's kind of how the occupation goes. Lots of red coats and whatnot. However, it wasn't exactly an easy job for the British either. Some folks just don't like being ruled over. I wouldn't. Interesting enough though, there was also a fair share of sicknesses going around. And when you think about it, I mean, you take a whole bunch of people, mix them in with another population of a bunch of people, to a place they've never been before, added with it's not the most hygienic time in history, sprinkled a little hot weather, and yeah, people are probably gonna get sick. Cholera, to be exact, cholera was a big one. So what's the solution? How do we cure this cholera? Is it, is it hand washing, hygiene? So, you know, do we keep our distance? What, what do we do? Well, the answer was cholera belts. And basically it's just a piece of red flannel fabric to wrap around your belly. That's how you cure cholera. At the time, cholera was thought to be caused by a chilly or cold belly. So warm up your belly, no more cholera. But in India where it's really hot and places like that around there in the Mughal Empire, it's kind of hot anyway, so I don't know why you need that. It doesn't really add up. Number two, diamonds. The Koh Anir diamond was literally the crown jewel of the Mughal Empire. A jewel worth more than anyone could really handle for the time. And uh, definitely today. It's too much for you. You don't want it. Too much pressure. You can never sell it. It used to be encrusted upon the Mughal throne, but after some violent disagreements, it was stolen and it passed hands, where it then went to someone else in their hands. And after that, then someone else had it. And then somebody else had it. And then, like a trinket your grandma tries to give you, it probably sat in her basement for a very long time before then it ended up in the hands of old blah to yourself, Queen Victoria. Who else? And either if you think that's fair or not, it's been a part of the British crown jewels ever since. Because they take stuff, that's what they do. Number one, Anna Carly. A classic tale of love and betrayal. And maybe it actually didn't happen. Historians aren't too sure about this one. But if it is true, oh baby, what a juicy story. Anna Carly was a poor peasant, but worked her way up to becoming Akbar's wife. Uh, but she also tripped, fell, and landed in somebody else's bedroom, if you know what I mean. Naturally, Akbar was cheesed. So he did the next sensible thing and had her buried alive in the walls like Bowser did to the Toads in Mario 64. However, no amount of Power Stars could help us find out if she really even existed. The story of the Forbidden Love, however, has been retold countless times in Asian culture. I was going to go for a Count of Monte Cristo reference that was stuck in the walls, but I feel like you guys know Mario 64 better. Pop culture beats books, right? Who reads books? That's been another amazing video from Bumblebee. <laughs> More top 10 history facts. Love it, baby. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe here at Bumblebee for more. And if you too like the Count of Monte Cristo like me, and that's the only book I maybe sort of read in high school, then check out my social somewhere down below. I'll make you laugh sometimes. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Heretic's Fork. Ah, uh, yes, I like sporks. This fork, I don't like. Another horrible thing for your neck right off the bat. Here we go. The Heretic's Fork was designed so that nobody has to physically harm the victim, which is one of the worst, in my opinion, because now it's on them to get hurt from this punishment, and then no one has to even and be responsible. A double-sided medieval fork, an old rusty, horrible fork, would be attached to your neck with a belt, anything that keeps the fork steady, you name it. So now the victim has to keep their neck straight or else the obvious and horrible what happened? Ugh, I hate it. I have a long neck too. That would be a long commute down. I don't talk about punishments enough on this channel. Some of them, I don't think I'm even allowed to, to be honest. The Heretic's Fork is no joke. We could thank the Spanish Inquisition for this device. Yeah, it was used from 1478 to 1834, most often to get the victim to confess to crimes. There's usually a Latin phrase on these heretic forks. That phrase is abiuro, translating to I recant. If you find a medieval fork in that third drawer down and it says that in Latin, get out of the house. That's all I'm saying. Number nine, mob football. Ah yes, some medieval footy. Let's do it. Growing up, I was lousy with footwork. I couldn't kick a ball for the life of me. Back in the 12th century, I would have been doomed would have been game over. Back in those days, it was called football because you played this game on your feet. 
you didn't necessarily have to use your feet to further said ball. And also the goalposts were sometimes miles away, so it made sense to use a throw or two. Also don't stress about picking favorites for your team. Each side consisted of 300 to 500 players, so plenty of room for you and yours. I also forgot the most important rule, of course. Um, you can fight each other. Yeah, you can full on have a brawl, whatever, no rules. It comes to no surprise that there were a few casualties. But finally, this game was banned come 1359. King Edward III punished those who played ball by six days of imprisonment. Yeah, it turns out when there's a bubonic plague and you're at war, maybe fighting each other and breaking bones isn't the best way to kill time. You know, maybe go and hit the archery arena. Archery arena? Go shoot some arrows. Go practice, go, go break some pots. I don't know, whatever Link does in his off time. Number eight. Don't blow it. This one rings a familiar bell. This is pretty humorous, I'm not gonna lie. We'll lighten it up a bit. Back in the 12th century, horse racing was born in a Suffolk town called the Newmarket. Once King James I got set up in 1606, the sport became more widely known and it was now a major form of entertainment as well. Eventually, laws had to be put in place to protect said prized pupils. Those horses were famous at this point, so if you think you can walk around the streets and, I don't know, blow your nose? Think again, pal. That's illegal. Yes, it was once illegal to blow your nose in the streets because officials didn't want horses getting ill. In fact, if you were outside sick at all, you had to pay a fine if you were caught. Yeah, imagine you're on your way to the doctors while you're sick, then you get pulled over for a temperature check. You're like, oh, not today, please, oh no. Number seven, forbidden shoes. 15th century shoes, look at these fancy things, come on. Imagine you have to help carry groceries, but you could only use these. When be done. Krakows or pikes, these were the talk of every town. The longer the toe extended, the more wealthy you seemed. I'm talking like six inches sometimes. See Mike's beat? That's huge. Dudes were tripping over their feet sometimes. It was crazy. Most importantly, the common folk were starting to look like royalty. Yeah, how dare you? How dare you look like the English crown, you poser? Finally, a law was passed in 1463. No knight under the rank of a lord, a squire, or gentleman, nor any other person shall wear any shoes or boots having spikes or points which exceed the length of two inches. That lasted until 1604. Yeah, God forbid you're wearing your dad's pikes and then you get busted. Too long, pal. Over two inches, go into the slammer. The punishment for a long pike was a fine of three shillings and four pence. Ah, do I have that? Oh, shoot. That's like 150 bucks today, give or take. Imagine that, all because of your shoes. All because you thought you were rich. Yeah, get a grip, peasant. Go change back into your Berks and socks. Number six, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society. It's honestly one of the worst. Because of the type of psychological distress that it causes, here we go. Basically, this form of punishment involves a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no meaningful contact with anybody else. That's the whole punishment. Now, the isolation that solitary confinement can create can be life altering for people. It's really bad. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long that eventually they just forget about their families entirely. Some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they can no longer speak. Isn't that crazy? Solitary confinement and the negative effects it has on one person is becoming a wider topic of conversation today because of said effects on a person's mental well-being and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Yeah, rightfully so. Can't mess with the brain. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was even worse. It was just a room made of stones. It was pitch black. It was freezing cold. It was also below some horrible stinky castle and most of the time you weren't really alone. No, there were some hairy creatures nibbling away at your toes, but I'll save that for the end. That's pretty, pretty horrible. Number five, medieval tennis. Not to be confused with Mario Tennis, although that's probably just as hard to play, if we're being honest. Medieval Tennis was introduced in 1485, and just like the other insane ball game we covered today, this too was eventually banned. Yeah, that's how you know it's a good one. If you weren't a noble, you couldn't play tennis. You weren't allowed to. You could only play if it was Christmas. Yeah, so you better write that on your wish list. Many believe tennis was disrupting labor and encouraging violence and gambling. Yeah, tennis, encouraging violence. Imagine that. Tennis was eventually referred to as the sport of kings because both King Henry VII and VIII were actually pretty good at it. Yeah, they're like Venus and Serena Williams of medieval times, only not athletic and not nice and also not good at tennis. I mean, why else would you ban the sport, really? Let's be honest. Number four, one meal deal. Okay, so obviously food was a little sparse back in the medieval age. Uber Eats wasn't around yet, but you know what was? 
Disease, yeah, and, and, hor and worse things, yeah. The life expectancy wasn't great, but even so, laws were still put in place so the common folk wouldn't overindulge. Yeah, hey, I know times are rough, but uh, can you stress eat a little less? Thanks. Yeah, you just look a little gross. Yeah, King Henry VIII needs his ninth bowl of soup, so please stop. They were actually upset that the common folk were matching the lifestyle from higher ups. Nothing to do with supply, really, just appearance. In 1336, a law banned people from eating more than two courses. Soup also counted as one meal, not a sauce. Believe me, they asked. Again, the only exception here at the time, mid 1300s, was Christmas Day. Then you get to eat and have fun and play tennis. Yeah, the one day you can overindulge is the same day you can play tennis. They're like, oh, I can't. Now I can't. Number three, the thumb screw. A little less graphic, but still a horrible specific device used for punishments, dare I say. The thumb screw was used in the Middle Ages to get somebody to spill information or confess to a crime they probably didn't even commit in the first place. We didn't have anything else to detect lies, so these soldiers would make horrible devices to get you to spill the beans or lie and say you did and then we can go home. This was one of the best cases, really, the thumb screw. It was also known as the thumbkin, and it would slowly crush your fingers, obviously. Just looking at it, you're like, uh, does it do what I think it does? Yeah, it does. This, of course, turned into the knee crusher, or even worse, the head crusher, which I obviously don't need to explain. Yeah, the classic medieval fork. Now they're getting creative, advancing their gadgets. Nice, we love it. I can't even imagine the knee crusher. That alone? No thank you, let's move on. Number two, the cake test. Of all the nonsensical tests performed during the Salem witch trials that we covered in part one and two, this one takes the cake. Yeah, pun intended, I did that on purpose. It sounds delicious, but in reality, it was just spreading the disease even more. This was a popular method of seeking out witchcraft in England as well. See, they would make a cake out of, well, you guessed it, rye flour. Remember that, rye flour. And then they would add a little bit of urine from the accused witch. Yeah, I'm more of a chocolate cake guy myself. Not a big fan of urine cake. But hey, who knows, maybe I'll change. But don't worry, nobody ate this cake, just an unfortunate village dog. Yeah, sad thing. They would feed this cake to a good boy, and then if the dog showed the same witchy symptoms, you know, being sick from said rye, then the town knew for sure that the accused was guilty. I just really wish one villager was like, maybe it's the pee. I'm just saying, number one, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic to finish off our horrible part three. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their rats and stuff, that's great, but cover their little eyes for this one. This is horrible, get them out of here. Rats were used as a medieval punishment. Ugh, where do I even start with this one? It was a punishment for the rats too, really. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure or bucket being strapped to his abs or his chest. Inside this enclosure, there are rats which the strapped down person can feel walking around in their skin. And then that's when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other side of the metal enclosure. And historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course, very quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. And many of you see where I'm going already and you're like, ooh, yep, it's gonna happen. From here, the rats begin to frantically search for a way out, the softest way out, because just like us, they have survival instincts. And the metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh, that's definitely not. Horrible, huh? Yeah, that's history. Number 10, shin kicking. I mean, it's literally exactly what you think. You kick each other in the shins a lot, like over and over again. An early 17th century form of martial arts originating in England, obviously. This combat sport is a very simple one. Hold on to the opponent's collars to become close and then kick the absolute out of each other's shins. Athletes would stuff their trousers with hay for extra cushioning and specifically design their boots to be stronger and more rigid. First one to fall or give up loses. Dude, I woke up this morning and cranked my pinky toe off the door. I literally almost blacked out. I don't know how these guys did it. Alcohol was forbidden before the game as well, which was loosely regarded. Yeah, obviously, I'm about to snap my tibia and fibula off someone's Doc Martens. I'm slamming a couple Guinnesses before. Number nine, chariot racing. Look, I'm still a new driver. Left-hand turns, they freak me out. I couldn't imagine chariot racing in any direction, even straight, no thank you. How do you even signal? Maybe, I don't know. Back in 700 BC, chariot races were like NASCAR. It was fast, it was loud, and it was dangerous. These events were held in arenas, like our modern forms of entertainment, and 10 chariots would race at the same time. It was chaos, it was a lot of dudes just flew out, it was nonsense. With tight turns and dust filling the air, it really was a spectacle. Horses were part of the Olympics come 684 BC. Four horse chariot races were being held in Olympia. You could have seen this. 
And then you watch the guy jogging, and you're like, oh, I, I like that a bit more. It's a bit more loud. I like that one. The riders, they were brave souls, man. The ropes were often attached to the riders' wrists so that if they went overboard, they immediately, it was bad news for them. They were toast. Nobody's going out easy in the Coliseum, even when there's horses and nice things involved. Number eight, marathon running. We all know those runners who are up at five and get their mile. Blah, 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 blah. Who likes this stuff, man? Well, apparently the ancient Greek messenger Phidippides did. In fact, it was his job. Yeah, this guy would just like run place to place telling people stuff. The 42 kilometer foot race originating just shortly after the huge battle of Marathon. Ah, this is in fact where the sport gets its name from. Basically a bunch of guys showed up early and Buddy was like, yeah, you gotta run as fast as you possibly can from Marathon to Sparta and warn them. But that's like 42.195 kilometers away. Exactly! Remember, and run as fast as you can. No water belt, no gel packs, just panic and blisters. This Olympic sport needs no introduction. Just put some shoes on and go for a run yourself. Next time you're halfway through your warm up on the elliptical, just imagine the summer of 490 BC. Wouldn't it just been easier to just text them that they're coming? They are coming. Scene. Oh, okay, that was, that was real easy, thanks. Number seven, fisherman's joust. Not to be confused with fisherman's friend, although that's also quite as intense. Fisherman's jousting or water jousting was a combat sport originated in ancient Egypt. Yeah, it goes way back. They invented beauty and also water jousting. That's pretty amazing, we love it. Keeping it, keeping it balanced. Each vessel would have a few players, players, he says, and using one long pole per aquatic team, they have to poke and push the other players out of their vessel into the water. I'm pretty sure Kyle and I did this growing up with pool noodles. We'd ride inflatable alligators and just smack each other. We didn't even poke, it's like the loose noodle, right in the neck too is the worst. You dip it, good night, that's it, you're off that alligator. Now of course it wasn't a spectacle like it was in ancient Egyptian days, but also may have not have been a game, turns out, yeah. Historians are still scratching their heads over this ancient hieroglyphic that appears to depict water jousting. Was this a fun pastime or was this naval combat over fishing territory? For us, it was definitely the latter. It was for sure the latter. I was like, this is my pond, dude. Get out of here. Number six, pancreation. This vicious ancient Greek contest combines punching, kicking, and wrestling for an all out physical combat. A mix of martial arts. Dude, this is literally UFC. And the tail of the tape. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's fight! Big John McCarthy, of course, commentator on this fight tonight. Coming to you live from Las Vegas. This is literally UFC, people. You win by either knocking your opponent unconscious or by making them give up. Buddy, Patroclus has me in a flying armbar. I'm letting all of Greece down with that tap. Okay, okay! Much like modern day combat rules, there was no biting allowed or eye gouging. I can't stop thinking about not only the brutality of the fighters themselves, but the fans. Thousands of years of crowds showing up to chant and cheer on their favorite warrior. Just a spinning axe kick another right in the face. I love it. Number five, gymnastics. Imagine being the first guy to ever do a backflip. Imagine being the first guy to ever see a backflip. I think that's more of a spectacle, if anything. Gymnastics were developed around 500 BCE. Ancient Greeks loved parkour, apparently. Who'd have thunk? Once the Romans invaded Greece, the Roman army made it a point to study gymnastics. They needed their soldiers to be quick, light, versatile, and flexible. Anything that makes them more terrifying, really, that's the better. Those moves were so dazzling that the Olympics had to include gymnastics as a sport. But once the games were outlawed in 939 AD, the gymnastics game almost, almost came to an end. Once the 1800s rolled around, we saw the return of tuck jumps and straddle sits. Thank God, we almost lost it, we were so, we were so close. German doctors Johann Friedrich Gutsmith and Friedrich Ludwig Jahn, they changed the athletic game forever when they created these new exercise routines for young men, including the pummel horse, balance beam, vaulting horse, horizontal bar, you name it, those things that we do when we work, you know, when we work out every day. Chris is like, yep, I do all those every morning. These doctors wanted to see some flips. They got flips, my friend. Number four, boxing. Straightforward and simple. This ancient sport is depicted from hieroglyphics in tombs of Egypt all the way to the wall carvings of ancient Sumer. One of the oldest sports events known to man, boxing has made a place to stay in history for the last 5,000 years. The Greeks made this form of brutality into a spectacle by wrapping their hands with leather straps lined with metal to either knock their opponents unconscious or even death. 
Oh, oh, okay, you wrap that under. Okay, how do you play ref? Oh, you just punch each other right in the face until there's just one of us. Got it. Weighing in at 145 pounds with a reach across of 71 inches in the blue trunks, Patroclus Angelopoulos. No mouth guards, no rounds, just punchy punchy and sleepy sleepy. I don't know why I'm still doing this voice. I don't know. <laughs> Number three, Viking hockey. Being a Canadian and all, this one, oh, this one hit, this one hurt. Buckle up lads, turns out Canadians did not invent hockey. Yeah, we found out during Canada's 150th celebration of all times. We're like, what? Yeah, we found out hockey wasn't so Canadian after all. It was Vikings, who knew? They actually brought it here in the first place. They also didn't call it hockey either. They called it a way better name. Slap Fatten. Go slap some fat around with the boys. Oh yeah, me and the boys are gonna grab some Timmies and go play some road Slap Fatten. Yeah, it's, instead of yelling car, they just yell R, and then they keep playing. They're like, no, turn around, go back. Slap some fat in your car. Vikings would gather sticks and of course some fat and then they would slap them in between two posts. They would just make two posts. Here or here, it doesn't matter. They'd make the rules up. Imagine getting cross-checked by a Viking. See you later, chest plate. Non-existent anymore. Offside. Number two, long jump. The long jump, originating in 656 Greece, was an Olympic sport consisting of simply hurling your body over a vast distance of horizontal space. Usually these spaces would include streams, bogs, or ravines. This ancient sport differs from the modern long jump, of course, just a tad. And of course, long jump wouldn't be long jump without the flute music. That's right, this sport was always accompanied by a flutist since music was a very important part of the spectacle of the ancient Olympic games. Hey man, can you play jump by Van Halen? Just kind of gets, no? Okay, you don't know that one? No worries. Back then the Olympians would hold weights in both of their hands, either one, two, or five kilogram carved stones almost like kettlebells to help them swing momentum after their initial run up. I love that the times are either something really safe and fun like swimming or jumping, and then you're like standing next to an athlete during the anthem whose job it is to literally break people. Uh, yeah, I'm a jumper. Oh, you're a fighter. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I jump, so nice man. Break a leg out there. No, 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 it's not what I meant. And finally, number one, no rules football. Personal favorite, always gotta bring this one up. This is so scary. I've never played a game of rugby. I don't even know. I don't want any part of this. Sport fans are a bit much. I'll start by saying that. The whole yelling at the TV thing, unless I'm seeing the Green Goblin, I'm not yelling at any TV screen ever, period. But sportsmanship goes back, way back. Football was also a lot different in the late 12th century. See, instead of corner kicks and throw-ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve said ball from the opposing team. Anything, like, you know, what we were mentioning earlier, you can just do that and just, knock someone out and take their stuff. Also, there's no limit to how many players you had on your side. You can grab thousands, hundreds, whatever, you name it. It would be town versus town. It was hilarious. They called this a sport. But finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. Obviously, people were dying for no reason. The only time diving was allowed was back in this game. I can, that's acceptable. When you would get kicked in the neck by a knight on a horse, more than fair. I'd say stay down if I were you, for sure. I would act, I'd be like, oh, my neck, what? See ya, two minutes in, I'm out of the game. I can't even play football today, let alone football in the dark ages. What a joke, my back already hurts from this. Number 10, Queen Victoria's passing. Some say it ended the Victorian era, but it actually kind of extended a little while past that. She was the longest reigning queen at the time and a symbol of Great Britain's power. She also wasn't the nicest. Uh, she oversaw the conquering of India, which pretty bad. The special flower wars in China, which saw China give five of its major cities to the British Empire, <laughs> including Hong Kong, which kind of an awkward one there too. So yeah, her passing was sad for most, but for others, especially foreign nations, it was a reminder that their brutal overseers are still there and they're probably still gonna rule for another like 70 years. Oof. Number nine, World War One. This is considered to be the end of the Victorian era and it makes sense, especially the first half of the war. It was a mixture of old world versus new world. Horses and cavalry swords versus Germans in trenches with large rapid fire blam blams. In Great Britain and of course other European nations, they were foaming at the mouth to attack each other. However, culturally speaking, they were the same since Victoria had passed. Not much had changed. However, after her passing, and of course after the war, big changes, huge changes. So much so that it changed the world and in different ways in different countries. Like we need a whole list to go over that, but empires fell, America got rich, and they went back fighting shortly 20 years 
later is kind of awkward. Number eight, stiff photographs. For some strange reason, people in the Victoria era were like the grandfathers of all goth kids. Any obsession people have today with the strange and unnatural, well, you can partially thank the Victorians. A good example of their obsession with the weird and oddities is post-mortem photographs. Yikes, yes. Given that photographs were a new and amazing technology, and for the time, yeah, they were, and that people had some less than living relatives lying about, well, it only made sense to capture their memory forever by having their picture taken. Dressed up, prepared, and positioned in many different ways just to bring the mantle by the fireplace together as what would a home be without the post-mortem photographs of your old Aunt Burge? Am I right or am I right? It's weird, I don't know. Number seven, grave robbing. If ladies of the evening and cold-blooded de-lifing have always been a part of life, then so was grave robbing. The second someone was buried with anything valuable, there's been a creepier person on standby with a shovel. That's just how it goes. Poor Dompe from Zelda. Guy gets a bad rap. This was no different in Victorian times. However, while digging up corpses for baubles and trinkets was certainly done, there was a far more lucrative business, especially for those in the mad scientist business. <laughs> Sorry. People were paid under the coroner's table to dig up cadavers and retrieve them for doctors and medical professionals to conduct all sorts of freaky deaky stuff. Mostly just to learn, but you can be sure someone got a little weird with it. We always do. We always take it too far. Number six, Christmas fire. One of the things my mama always taught me was fire safety. My dad taught me how to deal with a bonfire after 10 beer, but, well, mom's lesson was safer. Never leave the stove unattended. Put candles out when you're done and know your fire escape plan. You gotta know it, you never know. While this event may seem like a wholesome family fun on the holidays, I get anxiety just thinking about it. In Victorian times, families will play a game at Christmas called Snapdragon. You get a large dish or bowl or cauldron, I guess, large enough for everyone to gather around the table and fill it with a whole bottle of brandy. Then pour in some dates and large raisins. Then ignite said brandy ablaze and try to grab the blue flaming dates without getting burned. Folks, this is a time before modern firefighting techniques, burn medicine, and houses are just really close together. So one good fire could take down a whole block, maybe a city. Not a good idea, don't do this, don't recommend. Look, Mom, I got the flaming raisins. Now the curtains are on fire. Wow! Number five, the potato famine. Potatoes have been a staple of many cultures' cuisines for centuries, partially because of their ruggedness, easy to grow attitude, and not only filling, but very delicious. Ooh, let me some fries. Good box of hot fries and some salt, baby. Let's go. Well, 1845 Ireland was a wee bit different as a fungus outbreak was taking hold of the mighty potato harvest all over the country, thus creating a large famine that would see one million people or more perish in a large famine. Queen Victoria tried to help but was extremely ineffective and my help, well, I mean the same effort I put into reading books assigned to me in high school. Sorry, Miss Middleton, I used Cliff Notes. I'm sorry, I did. I used, I'm sorry, I love you, Miss Middleton, you're the best. But I read like 10 pages out of the book, so that's gotta count for something, right? Right? Number four, the Napoleonic Wars. Like World War I, this time can be stretched to include Victorian England. Why is this event so dark? Well, because Napoleon wasn't going to stop. France had recently discovered what freedom was, and sacre bleu, it tastes amazing. <laughs> and they overthrew their government. Napoleon surprised everyone by being an amazing general. Dude took on multiple nations at once, and won multiple times. It's extremely impressive. However, in a classic case of went to his head, he became the leader of France and declared himself the first consul of France, or emperor in other terms, and started stripping away rights, especially from women, which sucks, like a construction worker who kicks off his boots at 5 p.m. I know you're out there, you guys just, you just kick them off. Just get rid of them, those boots, they're stinking. He invaded other European nations and was on a path to destruction until the international community put, him to, put, put a stop to it. They said no more, dude. Number three, dirty, it's dirty, in it? Oh, it's dirty. It should be noted that the streets of Victorian London were not clean at all. Maybe the filthiest, maybe the filthiest ever. It was so bad that in 1858, the Great Stink occurred, which basically was all the refuse and filth piling up in the River Thames. Combined with a heat wave in the summer, the issue had literally been mounting for years and now would come to an offensive bubbling over. 
Oh, that must be awful. The smell was so bad it was making people sick, and people were most likely getting sick from the river from cholera outbreaks. God, that's disgusting. Cholera was more common than you'd like to think. It took some serious engineering and a lot of pumps to fix the sewage issue that was severely outdated. It wasn't fully fixed until 1875. Keep your soap and your hand sanitizing here, my folks. It's gonna be a little greasy. Number two, ladies of the evening. Oh yes, the streets of Victorian England were filthy, all right. And if every street corner was a lovely lass for lowering her dress in hopes of luring in a customer, as they say, oh yes, she shan't have to wait long, as this type of business was more common and profitable back then than you'd really like to think. Personally, I don't see why it is illegal, or still is, especially if it becomes regulated. I mean, why not? Let, let them do what you gotta do. However, it was bad. There was a lot of sickness and bedroom-related sicknesses. It wasn't good, it was horrible. I just fell off the box. Sorry, I'm an idiot. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Oh, not much I can say about this guy that YouTube won't let me say, so here we go. The first serial unaliver to do what they do in the pale moonlight. The streets of Victorian London were crowded, dirty, like I said, and oftentimes chaotic, so for a true psychopath like Jack to exist only makes sense. He was kind of a ghost. He was responsible for the passing of several women who worked the streets and, uh, well, they were really violent crimes. We can't show you, but we'll show you a picture of Jack in a cloak or something, maybe in the moonlight or something like that. The worst part is he was never caught, like ever. Not, they, we, don't, we never got him. Or he was a she. Or he was multiple people. We, we just don't know. There's many theories, but because of technology at the time and, and crime solving things, we just, we just didn't, we, we didn't get him. Number 10, Abe the Wrestler. At 20 years old with a record of 300 fights and one loss, he stands 6'4 inches at 185 pounds. Your future president of the United States, honest Abe, the chair, give him the chair. That's right, Abe Lincoln was quite the ruffian. However, the wrestling back then wasn't as organized as there was no WWF per se. It was mostly just a show of strength and skill, but they were competitions among men. Huge crowds gathered, towns watched, everybody gambled, it was great. A little wrestling. His fights earned him respect while campaigning too. He would even scrap hecklers at debates. Yeah, just walks down midpoint and Wheeler whips someone under their neck. His chirps were amazing too. He would just look at people like Gladiator and call them out. He'd be like, hey, I'm the big buck of this lick. If any of you want to try it, come on and get your wet horns. Yeah, I didn't think so. Sorry, Mr. Douglas, proceed. Thank you. Number nine, Roy Sullivan. They say lightning never strikes the same place twice, but if you knew Roy Sullivan, you knew that's not entirely true. Yeah, meet the man who was struck by lightning seven times and lived to tell the tale. Roy Sullivan was born in 1912. He sadly passed away in 1983 when he was 71 years old, but God tried, God tried a few times to get him out earlier, it seems. He was born in Greene County, Virginia. Roy was a park ranger in Shenandoah National Park in 1936. He was nicknamed the Human Lightning Conductor, and he appeared in the Guinness Book of World Records. Roy's first encounter with, you know, the might of Thor, was when he was just 30 years old at the Fire Lookout Tower. He said that lightning strike, again, out of the seven he survived, was the most painful out of all of them. The lightning bolt burned a strip all the way down his leg, even blowing a hole through his shoe. Yet somehow he survived. Roy was also hit by lightning in 1969 while driving a truck, and also in 1970 while gardening on an otherwise clear day like today, also in 1972 while inside a guardhouse, also in 1976 during another storm, and finally in 1977 while fishing. Yeah, Roy passed away in 1983, and to this day, two of his ranger hats are on display at the Guinness World Exhibits in New York City and South Carolina. This man cheated death eight times. Seven. Number eight, Miss Unsinkable. Violet Constant Jessup, AKA the queen of sinking ships, or Miss Unsinkable, was an Argentine Irish woman who worked as an ocean liner stewardess, memoirist, and Red Cross nurse in the early 20th century. Jessup is well known for having survived three sinkings of major ships the RMS Olympic in 1911, the RMS Titanic in 1912, and her sister, the HMHS Britannic in 1916. Yeah, talk about the luckiest person ever. Lady's got some angels watching over her, I swear. The first ship, they turned around and made it back just in time. The Titanic, well, watch the movie, you'll understand. And then the third ship, it must have just felt personal by that point. Really? 
Not to mention barely surviving tuberculosis as a child. This woman is truly a saint. Returning to work after all those accidents? Dedicating her entire life to the Red Cross? Trying to save others? Sadly, she passed away at 83. Number 7. Lost at Sea the Robertson family, they're quite a historical one. Strap in, folks. Back in 1971, Dougal, Lynn, and their four children, and Douglas, Neil, and Sandy, all set sail on what was planned to be a trip around the world. It sounds magnificent. Our family saw a movie once. Aboard their 13-meter boat, the Lucette, they traveled through the Caribbean and then across the Panama Canal to the Pacific, right? That was their trail. A year and a half went by, they were on route through the Galapagos, and one of the daughters, Anne, who was 18, decided to leave the voyage. Yeah, she's like, ah, you know what? I'm actually not on board for this anymore. I'm really seasick. Bye. And then in Panama, they took on a hitchhiker named Robin Williams. Great name. This hitchhiker was in for more of an adventure than they thought, because after this point, their lives were never the same again. West of the Galapagos Islands, a pod of killer whales struck the boat. Wood then began to crack, and the boat subsequently started to sink. They all moved to the inflatable life raft, but after 16 days of using their own breath to keep inflating it over and over 24-7, the six of them were sadly forced to relocate into an even smaller dinghy. Then they somehow survived for 38 days at sea, while sailing towards the center of the Pacific, with no goal in mind other than to survive. All they had to drink was some water left over from the Lucette, with sea turtles being their only diet. Yeah, save the turtles, unless of course you're stranded at sea, then in that case, sorry to 52 of you. Finally, after 38 days, they were spotted by a passing Japanese fishing boat, and then thankfully, they were rescued. Number six. Mad Jack Churchill. No, not that Churchill, but equally as British and even bolder. Mad Jack Churchill, aka John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill, was a British Army officer who fought in the Second World War with a longbow, bagpipes, and a Scottish broadsword. Dude, this guy lived a life. Was in like every war. Trained people how to fight and how to parachute. This guy was fighting machine guns with a bow and a sword. And was at like the front of the lines, leading them. Taunting people, playing the bagpipes. You know how intimidating that is? How is there not like 15 movies about this guy? Not only did he thrive in the rough stuff, guy revolutionized surfing. He was also pissed the Americans dropped some nukes. He wanted to keep fighting, you know? Like imagine that pep talk. What eight lads? I'm gonna play a wee jingle here first, and then I'm gonna go out, take this sword, and I'm gonna start swinging. All right? Good luck. Number five, fake France. Towards the end of World War I, Paris was tired of, you know, seeing their city of love get blown to smithereens, as one would. So they figured, you know what? Let's try and fool those Germans, right? Let's try and do some trickery. Let's just build a fake Paris and then shut out all the lights. And it worked. Yeah, they psyched them out. They created a decoy, a very large decoy. The life-size stunt double was posted up only a few miles west of the actual city in order to protect it. This tiny town called Mason's Lafayette, now of course it's looking a lot more full than it was when it was, you know, a hollow shell of a fake town, now it's a tourist area. There were once three different zones set up around the real Paris. Zone A was northeast of the city, had fake train stations, mimicked a suburban region of St. Denis, but it had a big fake Gare du Nord train station, right? That was the main pull. Like, hey, come on, we're looking nice and hopeful, come attack us, and it worked. Zone B, northwest of the city, that was Mason's Lafayette, the main fake Paris, right? And zone C was the industrial area, just east of the city. They had massive factories built with, you know, obviously nothing inside of them. This sounds pretty home alone when you think of it, but these missions only happening overnight, creating a light show with some big fancy props isn't a bad idea. It's gonna save a lot of lives and money. Lights were carefully spaced out so it looked like a breathing city from above, and they fell for it for some of the time. They looney tuned the Germans, and it worked. They're like, yeah, it's Paris. Hit that really fast. It's good. Number four, space junk. In 1961, John Glenn would become the first astronaut to successfully orbit in space. He lapped the Earth a couple times with the help of Friendship 7, NASA's command mission pushing ever closer and closer to the moon. While in space, Glenn and fellow crew noticed tiny gold particles that shone like fireflies. Quote, uh, this is Friendship 7. Uh, I'll try to describe what I'm seeing up here. Uh, it's a big mass of some very small particles that are brilliantly lit up like uh, they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're around a little. They're coming out of the capsule and they just look like stars. A whole shower of them coming over. Over. They had come to the conclusion it was liquid from inside the capsule and the suits leaking out. And that liquid was urine. Not aliens, not fireflies, not disintegrating ship. Frozen pee pee. Yeah, gets drinking all that tang all day. 
Glenn flew on Discovery in 1998 and became at age 77 the oldest person to fly in space at the time. Damn Shatner. Number three, Project MDXX. If you've seen Project X, this one's gonna ring a bell or two. About 500 years ago, yep, you missed it, in 1520, for two and a half weeks in June, both England's King Henry VIII and Francis Francis I, two of the greatest monarchs in Renaissance Europe, they both threw a joint birthday party that lasted 18 days, and it only cost about $19 million by today's standards. Nice. I went mini putting for my eighth birthday. That's why I called it Project MDXX. The numerals in the year, yeah, you get it, not bad. Not only was this a chance for them to celebrate their friendship, but it was also a chance for them to try and outdo one another and continue to show off. So for this huge bash, for starters, around 12,000 people showed up and gathered in the fields of the northern tip of what is now France. All tents, costumes, decorations were all gold embellished. Guests were fed 29,000 fish, 98,000 eggs, 6,400 birds, 2,200 sheep, and 216,000 gallons of wine just to wash all that clout down. Mm. On top of that, there were jousts, wrestling matches, elaborate mask parties. I have FOMO just talking about it right now. The two kings both wanted to outdo each other, but there were rules put in place beforehand. These kings could not compete with one another during the celebrations, right? So instead, they tried to outspend each other in a nice way. They're like, oh yes, look at all of my gold. No, look at all my gold. We love blowing all of our resources in two and a half weeks. Nice. Looking good, guys. Keep it up. Number two, Olympic arts. In the early 20th century, the Olympics were getting creative, literally. Hundreds of years of blood, sport, and victorious games, and people were looking for some new events. 1912, Summer Olympics, they decided to add official awarded medals for painting, sculpture, architecture, literature, and music. All right. One rule, though. They had to be of Olympic sport nature. Paintings of people boxing, sculptures of people whipping discs around, and of course, a couple doodles of some dudes playing rugby. Which won Gene Jacoby two gold medals. Of course, these were Olympic grade pieces of art. So you know they were the best of the best. Of course, you could compete in both sport and art. American athlete Walter Winnens took the podium after winning gold in sharpshooting, and also the very first gold in sculpture. Yeah, lovely. He made a little bronze horse pulling a chariot. Isn't that nice? People just taping up their wrists, mouth guards in, and you're just sharpening your pencil. Hey, how are you? About to draw. <laughs> Good luck. And finally, number one, Jurassic Timeline. All right, this one goes out to all the T-Rexes out there. If you're watching, hit that thumbs up with your little hands. Nice big reach hit that subscribe button. When we think of the times of the dinosaurs, we tend to think of all of them roaming the planet at one time, and then a meteor hit, and then they were all toast. But that is certainly not the case. It's a little shocking, but here's our timeline. Dinosaur communities were not only spread apart by geography, but also by time and the age of the dinosaurs. For one, it lasted so long that it included three separate geological time periods. It's a long time. Fun fact, there is more time separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from the Stegosaurus than there is separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from humans. Yeah, that's how long ago dinosaurs have been kicking, or not kicking rather, you know what I mean? We can't comprehend this time. Like this is so far away, it doesn't even make sense. We think of the ancient Egyptians, we're like, oh, that's, I don't know. Dinosaurs? Stegosaurus, you know those herbivores with the plates on their back and the spiky tails, they always do this and take out your cars, whatever, Jurassic World, I've seen it. They roamed Earth 150 million years ago during the Jurassic period and the age of the dinosaurs. And then the T-Rex first appeared about 80 million years after the Stegosaurus had been extinct. And that was about, you know, 67 million years ago from today. This means that while 80 million years separated those two, there's only 67 million years that separate us from a T-Rex. Crazy fact. Uh, hit that thumbs up. Topping our list at number 10 hasn't actually happened yet. April 13th, 2029. Some of you may know by now about that recent Leo DiCap and Jen Lawrence movie, Don't Look Up. Well, it seems like we're about to experience a little bit of that reality as it's predicted on Friday, April 13th, 2029, the most hazardous asteroid to Earth, 99942 Apophis, is set to pass Earth a mere 18,000 miles away. That's a lot closer than any of the satellites we ourselves have put into orbit, so put that in perspective. Now rest assured, because this could be a lot scarier than it is if it was to come any closer, but journal articles state that there's no real damage that will occur. However, there is some potential for some intense heat or even an effect on some gravitational pulls. Personally, the idea that a meteor of any kind could just come crashing into us with no warning and just end it all, 
Yeah, that's pretty intense. A Terrible Ship Captain puts January 13th, 2012 at number 9 on the countdown. It's a beautiful Italian getaway and life is good. That is until the Costa Concordia cruise ship stuck off of the reef on the Islo di Gaglorio and began to tilt. Passengers and staff were quick to start moving themselves against the tilt as fast as possible, being evacuated on the lifeboats. However, as the ship came to rest completely on its side in the shallow water, survivors had to be airlifted to shore by a helicopter. Tragically, 32 people did in this wreck, and a massive salvage operation took 19 hours to raise the ship from the reef where it came to rest, using multiple cranes. The captain did not go down with the ship, he actually fled during the evacuation. If you know anything about boats, it's actually not a joke that the captain is to remain on board with everyone else until everyone is safely off, even at the cost of his own life. The captain of the Concordia, Francesco Chittatino, was arrested for multiple manslaughter charges and abandoning the ship instead of directing a Evacuation. Next up, Tragedy in Evansdale. July 13th, 2012 is number 8 in the countdown. Friday, July 13th, 2012, cousins Elizabeth Collin and Lyric Cook Morrissey were dropped off at Grandmother Wilma Cook's house. They leave at noon for an afternoon of outdoor adventuring. Not long after, they're spotted by Myers Lake, and later at Lake Avenue, and then never again. Their grandmother, concerned at their lack of return after a few hours, called family and then called police. What started as a small police search turned into a sheriff and fire department search, but all that was ever recovered was the girls' bikes and Elizabeth's purse. After this, FBI's brought in with infrared aircrafts, cadaver dogs, and they combed the lake, but still no luck. Five months later, the worst case scenario is confirmed when hunters in the Seven Bridges wildlife area stumble across two bodies, who were eventually identified as Elizabeth and Lyric, found 25 miles from where they originally went missing. Autopsy confirmed the girls had met foul play, but that's the farthest police Police had progressed, leading the cousins to remain a cold case. This case is incredibly similar to that of the Delphi, Indiana murder of Abby Williams and Liberty German, who went out to enjoy a walk on a local trail and also disappeared. And speculation of a serial killer this region has existed for a long time. Both sets of girls were Caucasian, similar in age and appearance, and both were found in rural areas by hunters. Chillingly, the dates of both girls had vanished. 7, 13, 12, and 12, 13, 17 are anagrams of each other. Number seven, a real life horror story happened in San Diego on April 12, 2012. 22 year old Brittany Kilgore got out of a bad relationship and was starting anew. She had a lot on her plate and she was looking for help in moving. Unfortunately, she didn't have any friends who could, but she did meet Louis Ray Perez, who asked if he could assist her. He even had five of his friends come and help her too, on the sole condition she partied with him for just a night. She needed help and she was newly single. What harm could come from it? It was a couple days later that the body of Brittany Kilgore is found. Who Brittany met was not who she thought. Perez had a pregnant wife, Dorothy Maraglino, and a mistress, Jessica Lopez, back at home who acted as SMA puppets and partners. These three had concocted a scheme wherein Perez would find and abduct a woman to be used as an unwilling participant. Evidence showed Brittany to be their victim, as her DNA was found in their dungeon and items such as handcuffs in their home. Perez, Marilingo, and Lopez were all found guilty, and all three received life sentence without parole and will be deservedly rotting in prison. October 13th, 1972 is number six in the countdown, when 174 people were killed in the deadliest airplane crash in Russian history. The plane involved in the incident was a four-year-old model with no prior history of malfunction. As it approached Moscow at the height of 3,900 feet, Moscow Air Control gave the instruction to descend to 1,300 feet. The crew confirmed the instructions and started the descent as per usual. But rather than leveling off at the 1,300 feet, the plane suddenly lost altitude until it crashed into the ground at 390 miles per hour with no apparent reason as to why. To make matters worse, the plane was only three Three kilometers from the landing strip where it crashed, and at no point were the spoilers retracted or landing gear prepared. The lack of mic communication to the pilots after the descent began also leaves us without answers. While there has never been an explanation for the crash's cause, many speculate it was a lightning strike. But many don't ignore the coincidence that number five in our countdown is the Andes plane crash that also happened on October 13, 1972. While the Russian airliner's victims were all killed, on impact, the story of the ill-fated Air Force Flight 571 is one of extreme trepidation. After hitting an air pocket and being unable to regain altitude, the pilot lost control and the flight was slammed into an Andes mountain. The plane hit another two to three times before settling on the mountainside. Twelve were instantly killed. 
Seven were pulled into Fields Gate before the plane's second impact, and another four died at final impact. 29 survivors were left sprawling along the icy mountainside, their plane's white fuel sludge all but invisible in the snow to any would be rescuers that passed overhead. And after only 10 days, the survivors huddled around a radio listening to a broadcast saying that the search for their rugby team was called off. Imagine the defeat of that moment, realizing nobody was coming. Well, two of the survivors felt nothing but spite. They packed up and set out on foot. With no mountaineer or climbing experience, the men managed to survive 10 days and stumble across a local who alerted authorities to the situation. The two men managed to lead authorities back to where the remaining survivors, now only 16 of them due to an avalanche that decimated the fuel sludge and the another 8 so that they were finally rescued in late December. This is an intense level of perseverance, but none more so than being pushed to cannibalism. While it was first met with public revulsion, forced perspective of the incident made it obvious that these men were reduced to a brutal but necessary decision. Using shards of glass, they slowly had to start picking away at their family and friends in order to survive for over a month. Of course, when asked 50 years later, survivors state that they did what they had to and they would do it again if need be. March 13th, 1964 made psychology textbook infamy. Number 4. How 30 plus people witnessed the crime without one person intervening. Kitty Genovese was returning from the bar where she worked around 3.15 a.m. in the morning and parked her car only 100 feet from her house. While walking in an alley to get home, she was attacked by Winston Mosley in the middle of the road that was surrounded by apartment buildings with windows overlooking the area. During this attack, she was stabbed twice, and Kitty managed to break free from Winston, screaming out repeatedly that she had been attacked. This was apparently heard by many neighbors, but only one of them, Robert Moser, opened his window and screamed at Mosley to let that girl be. For a second, it worked. Winston fled, but only to return with his face disguised and finish the job. Kitty had lost a lot of blood and was barely able to move, making her unable to open her apartment. Winston found her in a back hallway of her building, where he her to death and unfortunately assaulted her. The attack spanned at least a half an hour total and Kitty died en route to the hospital in an ambulance. This event was preventable as it was witnessed by over 30 people. No one called the police or intervened. Interviewed after the fact, the neighbors gave a myriad of excuses as to why they didn't. They didn't want to get involved or be nosy. They thought it was a lover's quarrel. The tragic case became a staple in psychology classes as a way to illustrate the bystander effect, or now called the Kitty Genovese effect, which occurred when people fail to act in a situation because they assume just someone else will step in. Mosley recently died in prison at the age of 81, deservedly. Number three in our countdown, April 13th, 1963, we're touching down in Jamaica to discuss the atrocities of the Coral Gardens Massacre. Occur. The Jamaican government was decimated by the acts of British colonialism, and when they finally pulled back from governing the country, it left the economy, housing, and job availability buckling. The Rastafarians of the time were viewed with suspicion and contempt and found themselves harassed by the authorities often. The story begins with Rasta convert Rudolph Franklin, who became embroiled in a land dispute. Franklin was farming illegally, and the landowners employed the services of the local police to evict the squatters in an altercation erupted and Franklin was shot five times. He was taken to the hospital and treated, but only to be immediately arrested for marijuana possession and sentenced to jail time. By the time Franklin was free, he was a rightfully bitter man. A year later, Franklin and several Rastas had been squatting peacefully on the land in Coral Gardens, part of Montego Bay, that the Jamaican government was planning to make into a tourist-only area, which meant it would become a no-go area for the Rastafarians. When the land was sold to Ken Douglas, who attempted to drive the squatters off of their rightful land, an all-out riot started at a gas station property. The building was burnt and eight people died, including Rudolph Franklin. Prime Minister Sir Alex Bustamay was visiting the scene along with the Commissioner of Police and Head of Jamaican Defense Force. Bustamay's response, bring all the Rastas in, dead or alive. Police was dispatched to Coral Gardens and the surrounding areas. More than 150 bearded men, assumed to be Rastafarians, were rounded up and arrested. The men were beaten, tortured, and some were even killed and many had their locks cut off in a violent disrespect of their culture. Jamaican government officials have since apologized and put forth reparations to Rastafarians in 2017 for what they incurred that Friday the 13th. Number two in the countdown is the Paris attacks of November 13th, 2015. The attacks in Paris are remembered for their suddency and terror. While it's happening in the moment, it seemed that there was no end, no safety, and no place to run to. Functioning in three coordinated teams on the night of Friday the 13th, attackers hit the con concert hall, a major stadium, restaurants and bars almost simultaneously and left 130 people dead 
dead and another approximate 413 wounded. At 9.20 pm the first attack happens at Stade de France. Five minutes later an attack happens in the 10th district on Rue Alibert. While emergency forces are scrambling to the first two locations, the nightmare's brief pause ends at 9.32 pm. As a few streets south of Alibert, more attacks are reported at Café Bombière and La Casa Nostra Pizzeria in Rue de la Fontaine à la Roy. Four minutes pass and now it's attack reports from Rue de la Charon at 9.38 pm. Another two minutes pass and the chaos ensures at Boulevard Voltaire. And then the final blow is between 9.40 pm and midnight, when a sold out concert venue seating 1500 fans of California rock band Eagles of Death was attacked at full force. By now, the president was in crisis talks with prime minister as well as interior ministers and the president announced a state of emergency through France and a tightening of border controls. Please understand while these locations weren't on opposite ends of the city, law officials are being hit with all of these events in rapid succession on what expected to be a normal night. They're understaffed, unprepared, and that's truly what was the most scary. November 13th, 1970 left a continent decimated. Number one in the countdown, one of the most tragic natural disasters in history happened Friday 13th, November 1970, when Cyclone Bahola hit Bangladesh. Found to be the equivalent in strength to that of a Category 3 hurricane, it sustained winds of 115 miles per hour, and a storm surge allowed the shallow waters of the Bay of Bengal to funnel ocean onto the land. According to a 1970 report of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the surge pushed water up 16 feet high. Devastatingly, due to the Indo-Pakistani friction at the time, it's believed that if either country had known much about the incoming storm, they didn't share it with each other. It was noted that a large amount of the population had no idea the storm was coming, and there was indication that East Pakistani's storm warning system was not used properly, costing tens of thousands of lives. With nowhere to evacuate, people climbed trees to escape rising water, and many were swept away. Research reports that in a 1972 journal, the highest survival rate was adult males aged 15 to 49, which is consistent with the impression that those who are too weak to cling to trees, such as old, young, sick, and malnourished, or females in general, were selectively lost to the storm. The Bahora cyclone it confirmed 300,000 people, but it's believed to have taken the lives of 500,000 people, making it the deadliest tropical storm in history. Kicking off our list at number 10, Afterlife Servant. Ancient Egyptians were closely connected to the afterlife, or at least they tried to be. After a loved one passed, ancient Egyptians would ensure that they have everything that they needed in the living world as well in the afterlife, right? Every valuable belonging, everything that you held dear to you your entire life, ideally that's what you want to take to the other side, right? And that also in included, sadly, lifelong servants. These masters were thinking about their necessities in the afterlife and of course, being otherwise useless without their servant, they have to bring them too. Now I know what you're thinking, right? That would probably suck for the other guy, right? Yeah, it did. It really did. Someone dies, now you gotta go too? You're like, what? Forced to be a literal ride or die. That is impossibly unfair. That's ancient Egypt for you. This tradition thankfully changed before many of these famous pharaohs that we know were put into power. So it didn't last forever, this horrible theme, this idea, but it did happen a lot. Famous pharaohs came into power and this tradition underwent a change, but eventually this practice led to the introduction of number nine. The Shabti. The Shabti were tiny carved figurines that would often be placed inside of these tombs of the pharaohs. Now you've probably seen them at some point and thought that they were just a valued belonging, which obviously they were, but their real purpose was much more grand. These beautiful little works of art were always shaped like mummies and on each and every Shabti carved into them were special instructions that determined what job they got in the afterlife. Yeah, it's like the world's oldest resume right there. Number eight, what's the buzz? Here we go, shout out to all the bees. Cleopatra was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and she had some bold ideas, you could say. So we're not exactly sure of its purpose, but we have some ideas. But there's a large amount of experts that have all agreed that Cleopatra, Greek Egyptian ruler of Egypt, she was known to sometimes fill a small box with a bunch of bees, and then shake that box around to disturb said bees, and voila, now we have a very weak massage. There's been some speculation as to why she created this bee box, and sure, you can use your imagination to some degree, probably, yes. This invention, this scandalous idea, we're pretty sure it was inspired during her time ruling in Egypt, because, you know, all the bees. Also, to put a box of bees anywhere near your box of bees, you know what I mean? Bravo, that's brave. If she did what all these scholars think that she did with this vibrating box of bees, then double bravo. That's brave. I don't even go near one bee flying around, let alone a box of them. No, thank you. Number seven, shaved eyebrows. Ha! <gasps> 
Close one, I thought they were gone there for a second. Look, I love animals, okay? We all grew up with cats, dogs in our family, birds. We had a chameleon at one point, that was interesting. But nobody mourned for their furry loved ones like ancient Egyptians. When the family cat died back then, not one, but every family member involved in the household, they would all shave off their eyebrows to mourn the cat's death. Cats were loved extra hard back then. Yeah, you think cats were spoiled today? When's the last time you saw your friend with their shaved eyebrows after their cat passed away? Yeah, didn't think so. God forbid, but if that fateful day shall arrive, commit, you know what I mean? Shave them off, show them your love and shave them off. Number six, stitches. While surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, common surgeries, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, one, no painkillers and antibiotics, and two, it's gonna hurt and the list goes on and on, it's horrible. But one thing that's less invasive but still quite extremely important back then that was seen quite a bit during these times was the use of stitches. Yeah, probably need some at some point, building pyramids made of stones and rocks, you're gonna cut yourself. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own stitches in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers, hair, so gross, tendons, even more gross, and even wool threads. Evidence in different mummified remains have been discovered. Yeah, imagine that, you cut your arm, you have to use someone else's tendon to stitch it up. No thanks, just leave it open, I'm all set. In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus, that came to ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described, and they all sound like a great time. One example from the text of treating a laceration reads, quote, if thou findest that wound open and it's stitching loose, thou shalt draw together for him the gash with two strips of linen. Basically says, hey, if you cut yourself, grab a shirt. Good luck. Don't move too quick. Number five, breaks. Yeah, I've never broken anything and I don't plan to. It sounds like the worst thing. I see it on Reddit and I'm like, ooh. But living in ancient Egypt, you're gonna break a bone or dislocate something sometime. But back then, it's not like you can just head over to the emergency and get an x-ray or a cast and then get your buddies, a couple of pharaohs to sign it and get some crutches and be on your way. No, so how did they treat broken bones or dislocations back then? Well, we can look at one example from that Edwin Smith papyrus that I mentioned earlier, where there was a patient with two dislocated clavicles. Now the treatment here is described as follows. If thou examinest a man having a dislocation in his two collarbones, thou shalt find his two shoulders turned over and the heads of his two collarbones turned towards his face. Imagine reading this and you're like, okay, uh, I think we turn this this way. No, this way. Hang on. Thou shouldn't cause them to fall back so that they rest in their places. Thou shalt bind it with stiff rolls of linen and thou shalt treat it afterwards with grease and honey every day. Yeah, if you break something, don't put grease and honey on. Go to the doctors. That thumbs up, there we go. The more we know. Number four, dental surgery. Okay, so back in the ancient Egyptian world, it's not like you can go to the dentist, get your teeth checked and cleaned, whatever, once a year, however you do it, I don't know. And the diet of the ancient Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, the cleanest. If I can say that, you wouldn't have a set of pearly whites every single day, that's for sure. And that's due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, well, in your mouth, is not gonna feel too good. That would cause tooth loss or troubles at an early age. Through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time, and they're a little interesting, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, and yeah. Buckle up. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found from the fourth dynasty. Now this mummy and his first molar, a bunch of surgically produced holes were there that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were performed back then in some way, shape, or form. I mean, in the form of a bunch of holes, and it's disgusting, but they tried. And do remember, as you're watching this entire video, all this was done without any anesthetic. So drilling holes, breaking bones, putting linen into your arms, you're gonna feel all of it. Number three, Anubis. Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of mummification. Yeah, he, uh, he had an interesting hobby, this one. Anubis, historically, he oversaw the embalming process during mummification. A lot of steps involved in mummification, so the backup here, you know, the backseat driving, that is Anubis, I'm sure was appreciated. Ancient Egyptians were so sophisticated in the mummification process that they also had to get really good at another major, well, kind of creepy, surgery. And that is the post-mortem dissection. That matters, that's a pretty important step. See, in order to mummify the body, they needed to remove any moisture from it. Now this process included the removal of brain tissue, which was done through a quite a gruesome hook tool and some steady hands, that's for sure. This was not a medical practice, however, it was more of a spiritual one, right? It wasn't done by doctors, and this is exactly why they were getting extra up close and personal with internal organs during this process. The medical information they gathered during this process was never used for medical or medical advancement, but rather for spiritual, like Anubis, this ancient wonder. He kept trophies from those that he embalmed 
involved. Like, you know, different parts from people, that kind of thing. Word spreads, you know, hey, Nubis likes body parts, pass it on, this guy's weird. So in turn, for centuries now, Egyptians would then offer pieces of lifeless bodies to Anubis. They're like, you know what, hey, heard you like toes, big guy. Here you go, enjoy, put that in your jar. You love it. Whoever gave him the jackal head, great call. That was a great call, he loves that one, big fan. Number two, dirty trick. The god Osiris ruled over ancient Egypt, but it wasn't an easy path, okay? Just like ancient Rome, there's always a jealous brother or a jealous someone watching from the bushes, okay? Osiris' brother, Set, he was a jealous one. So he tried to take out Osiris at every single turn. Now, what elaborate plot was so crazy that it actually worked? This was like a saw trap set up. This is insane. So first, Set designed a coffin that fit Osiris' measurements, like to a T. So at a party, casually one day, Set challenged Osiris to hop into said coffin, saying, challenging, that if he can fit inside of it, the coffin is his. Yeah, like a gift. So for some reason, Osiris accepted the challenge, he jumped in, and as soon as Osiris got into the coffin, bam, Set locked him inside and threw the coffin in the Nile River. So in turn, Set then took over control of Egypt. Yeah, gotcha, got the last one there. So if any of your coworkers wanna show you a coffin in the break room, respectfully decline the offer. It's, uh, it's probably a trap. And finally, number one, scarab worship. Yeah, we're getting stinky for the last one. Ancient Egyptians, they worshiped scarabs. They worshiped dung beetles. Now, when we think about animals in relation to ancient Egyptians, we go to cats first. But really, it was dung beetles the whole time. They're OG, those little stinkers. Egyptians could not keep their hands or their minds off of dung beetles. The Egyptians would observe scarabs rolling these balls of dung, and they would roll them along the ground until suddenly each beetle would disappear just like that into a hole in the sand. Now, ancient Egyptians compared these patterns to that of the sun. Sun, which of course would go over and then leave at the end of the day. Just the ball rolling and then disappears. I can see the connections. Now the god Kefri was depicted as a man with a massive scarab as a head. So he was responsible for rolling the sun across the sky every single day. And no, the sun wasn't a big ball of poop. It was just a big ball of life. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Pope Gregory the IX. Pope Gregory the IX was the Bishop of Rome and the ruler of the Papal States from 1227 until his passing in 1241. The Papal States were a series of territories in the Italian peninsula that were under direct rule of the Pope from the 8th century all the way to 1870. It turns out that Pope Gregory the IX had a very strange hatred for cats. He said that black cats were actually instruments of Satan, which seems a little extreme, but then he actually went as far as to order that they be exterminated throughout Europe, which is definitely a little extreme. With this order, the Pope's followers had to oblige, and there was a drastic reduction in the cat population. Population. But of course, this caused a disturbance to the ecosystem, and the time and the consequence of that became very evident. Because of the decline of cats, there was a sudden increase in the amount of rats, most of which may have been carrying the plague. There are a lot of historians who would argue that this war on cats may have had a huge effect on the severity of the Black Plague. That is, of course, speculation, as it's pretty difficult to pinpoint who could be at fault for something like that, but it certainly is a very interesting point. This all really does, however, bring me to my next point. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Black Death. I'm sure we've all heard of the Black Death at some point or another. I mean, how could we possibly ever stop talking about something like that? During the 1340s, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague that spread rapidly throughout Europe and Asia. It was called the Black Plague because of the fact that this illness would cause people's lymph nodes to become swollen and black. The Black Death was absolutely terrible, and it caused a lot of agony for those who had to go through it. Symptoms included things like severe body aches, fever, vomiting, and eventual death in most cases. There was no cure for the plague, so it just continued to spread. In the end, the Black Death took the lives of hundreds of millions of people. We now all know firsthand what it is like to live through a pandemic, and I certainly wouldn't sign up to do it again anytime soon, so I'm most definitely sure the times of the Black Death were some of the worst times in history. Apparently, it is said that if you lived in the 1340s, there was basically a 50-50 chance that you'd survive the Black Death. And then on top of that, there's all of the other horrifying ways to die that the medieval times held. All in all, I'm kind of shocked that we're still here today. In our number eight spot today, we have the Mongol invasion. Being in China during the Mongol invasion certainly was a terrifying time. I'm sure a lot of us here have heard at least some of the stories surrounding Genghis Khan, but if you 
haven't, let's just say that being on his bad side certainly wasn't a good thing for you. In 1205, when the Mongol invasion in China began, it was the regular citizens of China who paid the ultimate price. What was started by Genghis Khan was carried on by his son and then his grandson, which ultimately led to a 74 year long campaign that was filled with brutality and destruction. Cities and towns were destroyed, empires were brought down, and millions of completely innocent people lost their lives. It is believed that this invasion took the lives of enough people to cut the population in half from 100 20 million before to just 60 million after. Anyone living in China at this time would have had to live in the absolute fear of being killed for something that you really had nothing to do with. That would be awful and absolutely terrifying. In our number 7 spot today we have Pope Formosus and Pope Stephen VI. Pope Formosus was the ruler of the Papal States from October 6th, 891 until he passed away on April 4th, 896. After his passing, Pope Boniface VI took his place as ruler for just a few weeks before he also passed away, which then left Pope Stephen VI as the ruler from then on until his death. After this whirlwind April of 1896, things got even weirder. Before his passing, Pope Formosus had sided with Arnulf of Carinthia against Lambert of Spoleto, which was definitely not okay with Pope Stephen VI. So once Pope Stephen VI gets to the place of being the ruler, he gets the people to exhume the body of Pope Formosus so that he can put him on trial. I feel like this is very gross and very unnecessary, but this really is the type of stuff that went on in the 800s. They propped the body up for trial and had a deacon and answer questions for him since he obviously was unable to do that himself. They ended up finding the corpse guilty, which seems a little unfair, and they actually went as far as to strip the body of its sacred vestments, took three fingers from the right hand as they were the blessing fingers, they dressed the body in regular people clothes instead of the clothing a pope would be buried in, and then they reburied the body. If this poor man's body hadn't been through enough, it was later re-exhumed again and thrown into the river. If this story wasn't already wild enough, this whole debacle is actually what would later end up getting Pope Stephen imprisoned and then killed, alright? So I guess the other pope had his justice in the end, I don't know man. In our number 6 spot today we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his 4 decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him hacking up Nights, imagining that he was Saint George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was completely abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances blocked off. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Italian Renaissance dark side. Just at the tail end of the years of the medieval period, as we transitioned into the Renaissance period, began the Italian Renaissance. When we think of the Italian Renaissance period, it is known for the development and the rebirth that it caused, which makes a lot of sense considering the word renaissance means rebirth. But there is one less glamorous and slightly frightening side to this period that isn't always spoken about. Sailors who had been returning from the new world at this point brought something less than lovely back with them and that was syphilis, which spread through an entire French army. After this, the troops brought what was called the great pox to the rest of Europe. Since there was no penicillin back then, the disease spread rapidly in the the symptoms were pretty gruesome. It would often happen that the person who had fallen ill would have the skin on their faces essentially be rotting away which would leave large ulcers. Sometimes people's noses or lips would be pretty much gone and it happened often that people would very sadly pass away from the disease. So basically what we think of as a really beautiful time in Europe was both world changing but also very scary and like I don't know kind of close to a zombie apocalypse. In our number 4 spot today we have William the Conqueror. In 10 in 87, William the Conqueror decided to take on an all alcohol diet. This is because he was suffering from extreme obesity and was struggling because of that fact. 
fact. Because of this, he told his staff that he would only drink wine until his weight went down, but he ended up passing away less than a year later. And most of us are told that obviously this was because of the wine only diet. That's actually not true. In an astonishing turn of events, this wine only diet actually worked. Shortly after beginning his diet, he was able to ride his horse again, which was one of the main reasons he started the diet in the first place, as he was previously too heavy for the horse to carry. He actually died after falling from his horse during an expedition, which was completely unrelated to either his weight or his diet. It's entirely possible that had he not gone on this diet, he would have never ridden his horse and maybe would have lived longer? Truthfully, who knows? But I suppose in a very roundabout way, he did still kind of die from his wine only diet. In our number three spot today, we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed and during the time her son was too young to rule just yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out by using scalding hot water. Yeah. Don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it really doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. It seemed like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slang, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from. She devoured devised a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she definitely was not okay. In our number two spot today, we have Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was a deputy to the ruler of the Mali Empire, but when the ruler went missing while on a sea voyage to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, Mansa Musa became the ruler in 1312. During his rule, European nations were really struggling due to civil wars and a lack of resources, but the Mali Empire was flourishing because of their abundance of resources like gold and salt. Under his rule, the empire grew to take up a large portion of West Africa as he conquered 24 cities and their surrounding districts. At this time, Mali was one of the top producers of gold in the entire world, which left Mansa Musa as one of the wealthiest historical figures ever. One of the most well-known events during his rule was the pilgrimage to Mecca. This journey took place from 1324 to 1325 and spanned an estimated 4,000 miles and it was the first time people outside of the empire saw just how wealthy he was. He traveled with 60,000 of his men all wearing Persian silk along with 12,000 slaves who each carried 4 pounds of gold bars and he also brought heralds who had golden staffs along with a bunch of camels and horses. This pilgrimage had a profound effect on Egypt as this huge group of people passed through. From the markets in Cairo to the royals to the impoverished people that crossed their path, Musa left Cairo littered with so much gold that it depreciated the value of the metal in Egypt and it took decades for them to recover. In our number one spot today, we have St. Marcellus's Flood. This was actually a very serious extra tropical cyclone that swept through around January 16th, 1362. This cyclone eerily matched up with the new moon and it spanned through the British Isles, the Netherlands, Northern Germany, and Denmark. Here's the thing, this storm not only lined up with the moon, but also peaked on the feast day of St. Marcellus, which is the reason it got its name, but usually people refer to this one as the second, because there is another. The first St. Marcellus flood took the lives of 36,000 people as it swept through the Northern Netherlands in 1219. The second flood, however, while no one is sure the exact numbers, it is estimated that at least 250,000 people lost lost their lives. While there have been plenty of devastating floods in history, this one is said to be blamed on Atlantic gales and that this event goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. Our first stop is Italy's Colonoro Psychiatric Hospital. It's part of artist Herbert Baglione's Project A Thousand Shadows, which represents the tortured souls of those who passed in this place that still roam the halls. That's why anyone who visits this long abandoned psychiatric hospital a little outside of Parma, Italy, may be in for a fright, stumbling across the black 
black ghostly figures painted alongside the walls, floors, ceilings, beds, cribs, and wheelchairs. This asylum went into operation in 1873 after the cholera epidemic. This ancient palace was refurbished as a hospital for the sick and was actually meant to be a convent. As a temporary setup, it was highly unprepared for what was to come or how it would stay. Inside, there were more than a thousand patients. The asylum taking in not only the mentally ill, but also orphans, homeless, addicts, vagabonds, and working girls. The corridors were thin and narrow, and the rooms were organized into small compartments. So patients were often disoriented walking the different floors, and the tiny cells immediately led to discomfort from claustrophobia. Usually, hospitalized people of this time were forgotten by everyone, as so it was as if they disappeared when they went there. Naturally, psychiatrists working in this institution were free to take advantage of that and experiment with new treatments and practices, such as electroshock or frontal lobotomy. This way, the doctors felt like innovators and experimenters, while patients were no longer considered people to them. Italy's ban on asylums with the Basagalia law closed this hospital in 1979. Some former inhabitants of Colonaro speak of strong noises, thuds, sounds of water, and slamming doors that they heard during their silent nights there. From the psych to the pen, let's talk about Missouri State Penitentiary. It was the oldest continuously operating prison at one point, and Time Magazine once described this infamous maximum security facility as the bloodiest 47 acres in America. Open from 1836 to 2004, in the 168 years of operation, this prison saw executions, inmate uprisings, escapes, and corruption, so much that it earned that nickname of the Bloody 47. Inmates were subject to intense abuse and neglect. A guard could whip a man for literally anything or nothing at all. Look at him wrong in line. He's having a bad day. Men in the dungeon would be beaten within an inch of their life. These 4 by 3 cells would sometimes have as many as 8 or more people in them. In 1937, a bill was passed in the state allowing execution by lethal gas. A total of 40 men and women were put to death in this chamber here until the capital punishment inmates were moved to a new prison. Among famous former inmates are James Earl Ray, the convicted assassinator of Martin Luther King Jr., and John B. Firebug Johnson, who earned his nickname by starting a fire there that killed several inmates. Meanwhile, on a more positive note, Charles Sonny Liston arrived in 1950, having been convicted of robbery and having learned to box while inside, won the National Heavyweight Championship in Chicago in 1953. Visitors can see the yards, tiny cells, housing units, and most chillingly, the gas chamber. A familiar name may be Jonestown, Guyana. One of America's, if not the world's as a whole's most shocking mass tragedies was the deaths of the 909 members of Jim Jones' doomsday cult. Jones started as a preacher who formed the People's Temple in Indiana in 1950s. He later moved his followers to California and then in the 70s to the remote Amazonian village in Guyana where he promised that life would be a utopia. It wasn't. It was a hellish labor camp meets tropical island. And it ended in disaster as Jones's followers fed themselves and loved ones no name brand Kool-Aid laced with cyanide. While that was happening, those who tried to escape with visiting American politician Leo Ryan were met with bullets on the airstrip. This now once promised utopia sits and decays, being swallowed back by the Amazonian rainforest. Empty living quarters, untouched workrooms and garages, a children's school, and Jones's famous preaching pavilion with his chair still front and center, they all remain. While you can visit, it is an immense amount of work to accomplish. But you'll know you arrived when you see the friendly arches and their jolly green font welcoming you to Jonestown. Call it Hotel California, except you don't want to check in. The Sanzi Resort. Their construction began in 1978 with the intent to create a modern tourist destination north of Taiwan. Doting cute color pops and pastels, all while in a quirky modular shape, these resort units would have been immensely popular if a series of tragic events combined with financial trouble and local superstition hadn't eventually led to the complete cancellation of the project in 1980, only two years after they got started. There were many stories in circulation that suggested the site of the Sanzi UFO resort was cursed. People believe that spirits of those who lost their lives in fatal construction accidents roam this site. People think that the land is actually cursed from ancient Dutch burial ground, as 20,000 skeletal remains of 17th century Dutch soldiers were found on the site, according to lore. And to add to the creepy factor, some locals are convinced that the destruction of a Chinese dragon statue that once stood at the entrance of the resort property, demolished to widen the road, led to the site being cursed and the subsequent fatal accidents. The site lay abandoned for three decades, accessed by only squatters, ghost hunters, and nature. Then sometime between 2011 and 2014, the structures were finally demolished and the site cleared. One of the scariest places in America is McPike Mansion. Tucked into the countryside of Alton, Illinois, this Victorian mansion has a very long history of strange activity and reported paranormal phenomena. The house was built in 1869 by architect Louis Feifenberger. The original owner of the mansion was Henry Guest McPike, who owned 15 acres of land then known as the Mount Lookout Park. Here, McPike, a horticulturist,
Adventurous perfected his McPike great. The family lived in this, their country home, until 1936. And then it was abandoned just like that. The house has changed hands several times since its original owner, Henry McPike, hasn't lived in it since the 1950s. The building has been home to the Browns Business College and was later owned by Paul Lashinger, who rented rooms in the house to other occupants. While it's uninhabitable, the current owners who have invested thousands of dollars into renovating the dilapidated home believe that there are dozens of spirits who maintain presence in and around the home, closing doors, throwing things, and banging around. It's readily known today for its hauntings in paranormal circles. The grounds are often visited by ghost hunters and haunted tour groups in the area, even TV shows such as Ghost Adventures. Country Roads, take me home. It's West Virginia Penitentiary. This gothic baddie definitely completes with Danvers in which looks more like a vampire's house in a Scooby Doo movie contest. But like Danvers, this beautiful exterior may pass for a mansion or castle, but it is a shell for the bitter truth within. West Virginia Penitentiary opened in 1860s and was intended to mirror the prison in Juliet, Illinois. Unfortunately, inmates were immediately crammed into tiny cells that measured 5 by 7 feet, sometimes occupied by three prisoners each. Most prisoners had been convicted of serious crimes, with the most feared inmates being locked up on the north side, dubbed the Alamo. More chillingly, inmate Paul Glenn was made to build the prison's electric chair, dubbed Old Sparky. Close to 100 people were condemned to death, either via the chair or by noose. Unsurprisingly, the prison's tough, cramped, and often brutal condition, not to mention high number of death penalty inmates, earned it a reputation as one of the harshest correctional facilities in the US. During an inmate uprising in 1973, prisoners held hostages and set fire to the prison basement. Another in 1986 saw 20 inmates storm the cafeteria in protest at poor conditions. The following years had series of high profile breakouts. The prison was closed in 1995 after a court order ruled that the conditions were inhumane. Who would have guessed? This asylum is also in the Bagel City, Willard Asylum. Built in upstate New York on the bank of Seneca Lake towards the end of the 19th century, it starts off well intentioned and pretty decent. It's created around the idea of moral treatment, keeping patients clean and fed, keeping them occupied with sewing, gardening and other tasks, and even dare say attempting to treat their illnesses. And while this idea was successful at first, like teenagers in love, some things ain't meant to last. Like any place in the mid 1900s, trying to handle mental illness, there were deaths. Because of most of the residents had nowhere else to go with societal rejects, and since diseases like tuberculosis and typhoid were still knocking around the building making it a quarantine, it's estimated that about half of all patients who arrived never left. But that's not the creepiest part. When the asylum was closed in the 90s, workers made a discovery in the attic. There they found 400 suitcases, carefully wrapped and labeled with the names of patients and filled with their belongings. See, the average length of a stay was around 30 years. Many of those who died didn't have any family left to claim anything, so rather than throw everything away, staff packed patients possessions into suitcases that they had when they arrived and stored them in the attic where they remained as a time capsule for hundreds of forgotten lives. A Lovecraftian muse, it's a blend of beauty and nightmare, it's Danvers estate. Not only inspiration for Arkham Sanatorium, HP Lovecraft also mentions it in Pickman's model and the shadow over Zinn's mouth. And it's understandable why, this hospital constructed in 1887 is hella gothic. Check that out. Nice, right? Anyways, it was designed based on a mental health advocate, if you want to call them that, at the times, this concept of a positive environment that meant ornate interiors, private rooms, and long, rambling wings that would let sunshine in. But while Danvers was meant to be an appealing place for whose interior promoted the health and well being of its patients, as the decades wore on, this structure that was only meant to hold 600 patients was housing a population of 2,360 in 1939. The staff whose size had remained relatively stable was at a loss for how to control the patients who were sick and dirty from their lack of care. Visitors to the hospital in the late 1940s described the patients as aimlessly wandering the halls or vacantly staring at walls. Sometimes the patients passed away out of the staff member's sight and weren't discovered for days, rotting away in some forgotten room. Eventually all of the nightmarish trappings of the asylum were introduced, solitary confinement, straitjackets, shock therapy, and it was the birthplace of the transorbital lobotomy, a procedure that spread all around North America. Portions of the hospital were blocked off starting in 1969, and most of it closed by 1985, the entire campus shut down in 1992. The old Inunaki Tunnel deserves its own horror franchise, let alone a video game. Deep within the mountains of Fukuoka, Japan, is the small remote village of Inunaki. A sign saying, the Japanese constitution is not in effect past here, hangs near the entrance of the village. The area near an old Inunaki Tunnel has been considered to be haunted due to a number of killings connected to this place. The tunnel's construction was completed in 1949 
and was closed when a new one was constructed in 1975. In December of 1988, the charred remains of a man were found within this closed mountain tunnel. The perpetrators of this gruesome act were five young men who had wanted to rob the man and steal his car. All were sentenced to life. In another case, a young couple in the mid 70s broke down on the roadside and went in search of help, and they were confronted and killed by an old man with a sickle. The area also has a history that goes back over a thousand years as a training ground for esoteric Buddhist practitioners who claim the area to be a spiritual hotspot of lost souls. The tunnel itself has been sealed off with concrete blocks, but an opening at the top of the tunnel still allows entry for anyone foolish enough to climb over. Seeing as it's no longer in use and far off the beaten path, that means no assistance would be able to reach you in an emergency situation, so it's highly discouraged you try anything stupid. And finally, not the Italian getaway you're looking for, the Ospedale Psichiatrico di Volatera. Man, that was hard. Dubbed the place of no return, the ruins of this hospital now lay decaying in Tuscany, Italy. Inside, there are still a few items that were left in 1978, the year the hospital was abandoned. Wheelchairs, an old telephone booth, sunbeds. Founded in 1888 for the mentally ill and poor, the ward did well in the early 1900s with significant development, expanding gradually with the creation of shops, services, an agricultural company, and a judicial section. Luigi Scabia's plan was to build an independent village in which patients could feel free, but also rehabilitate and tailor work to each patient. This is how it goes until Luigi dies. After that, his successors over accept patients and the hospital grew to become one of the largest asylums in Italy. 6,000 people were housed in a ward at a time, with 20 sinks and 2 toilets every 200 patients. People were sent there not only for minor emotional problems, but also for political crimes. Patients were subjected to controversial treatments such as insulin therapy and electroshock. Inmates were often sedated, isolated, or placed in tanks full of ice. The rooms had prison-like grates and the nurses were addressed as guard or as superior. Patients were even tied to their beds in straight jackets and letters from family were concealed from them. This hospital was shut down with the Basigilia law that ended the age of asylums in Italy. The walls of the hospital courtyard are still covered in carvings of a patient who was locked inside for more than a decade and the structure rots away into the ground. So let's start off with a bit of a classic to warm us up, the Terracotta Warriors. When laborers digging a well in China in 1974 discovered a life-size statue of a soldier, they had no idea how much more lay beneath them. Archaeologists started excavating and today think there are as many of 8,000 of these clay statues. Most are warriors, but there are full-sized horses and chariots as well, also dancers and acrobats. All figures have their own facial expressions and features unique to them. This vast terracotta army testifies the absolute power and great ambitions of the first emperor of China. Qin Shi Huangdi, who is buried in the tomb at the site, hasn't been excavated because of concerns about its stability. But if his burial record is any indicator, there are enough traps inside to make for an effective enough curse, notwithstanding the alleged curse the emperor himself placed on it. After all, it did take 700,000 workers 36 years to build this tomb, and supposedly many of those workers were buried alive inside to keep what's inside there a secret. And it's worked. No one knows what's in there. There's also the matter of the potentially cursed terracotta army. According to an interview on Swiss Info with one of the many men who accidentally discovered the emperor's army, there's a widespread belief that these statues were never meant to be seen by other men, and that would bring great misfortune onto the surrounding villages, all because it was a major disruption of the dead emperor's feng shui. While the Chinese government continues to protect the actual tomb, it will remain a mystery what sort of protection the emperor took with himself to the grave. How about a scary discovery and scary consequence? Tamerlane's tomb. As written in Atlas Obscura, Soviet scientist Mikhail Gerasimov woke up one day feeling spicy and felt like digging up a horrific conqueror, Tamerlane, to reconstruct his bashed in face. So ignoring the outcry of religious leaders, locals, Muslim clergy, literally anyone, these curious yet emotionally stunted anthropologists opened the tomb for the first time since 1941, also ignoring two consecutive warnings on the tomb itself not to. The first is in plain sight outside of it, when I rise from the dead, the whole world shall tremble. The second was a surprise hidden within the tomb itself that nobody had opened before these dummies, and it said, whomsoever opens my tomb shall unleash an invader more terrible than I. Freaky. So naturally, they cracked the bad boy sarcophagus open. No consequences on the spot means none at all, right? Three days later, Germany launched Operation Barbarossa and invades Russia. Few would argue that the push broom mustache dictator would qualify as an invader more terrible than Tamerlane. Those that dispute the curse point out that Operation Barbarossa was always planned and subtly underway before the opening of the tomb, which is all well and good, but in 1942, Stalin demanded the return of Tamer to his tomb since the body had been taken. When the 
body was finally returned and buried with full Islamic rites, the Battle of Stalingrad's advantage shifted, changing the course for the Russians to win. So who knows, right? I think your own sudden imminent death counts as a scary discovery. So if, if so, King Casimir counts. And 50 years after the mysterious circumstances surrounding King Tut's exhumation, a similar incident occurred in Poland at the tomb of Jagiellon, where the King Casimir rests. Poland was a socialist country at the time of exhumation, so many types of research were restricted. It wasn't easy to receive an agreement to examine historical sites, and it took the Cardinal Archbishop of Krakow to support the researchers, who were just dying to get their hands on the shriveled corpse of the king, and for the final decision to be his to allow the opening of the tomb. Wrong call! Little did they know what they'd stumble upon. Researchers were eager to figure out more after the king's death 500 years ago, and they dug right in. It was worldwide news, as was the curse that the researchers kept joking about that was supposed to take their lives. Unfortunately for them, funny anecdotes become prophecies. As the examination was in process, those involved started to die from strokes and infections. Within the first few days, four are dead. Within years, around 15 are dead. Yeah, turns out they discovered deadly mold, the same as in Tut's tomb. As many historians have quietly mumbled about, there's always the possibility that maybe, just maybe, that mold wasn't something that grew over time, but was placed by a clever mixologist. Call Guinness World Records because this tomb has the most curses per square foot dead body paradise. Saqqara is genuinely called the ancient city of the dead, and you may have heard of it since it's right up there with King Tut for Egyptian burial site hotspots to visit. Its origin traces all the way back to the first dynasty, where it hosted burials for more than 3,000 years before seeing its last ceremony and resting sealed for centuries. And with how Egyptian family goes, 3,000 years of royal burials can accumulate quite the cast of characters, many of whom would want to protect themselves and their riches in the afterlife. Essentially, when archaeologists got down there, they had to send the most cynical, non-spiritual MFs they had. There is so much buried there that they turned up over 160 different sarcophagi and countless precious artifacts. Not complete without a few curses inscribed, of course, to prevent grave robbers or genuinely F up anyone who enters the chamber. Akamahora's sarcophagus essentially warns that whatever is done to against its tomb, the same shall be done onto your property. It also warns that any impure trespassers will be filled with the fear of seeing ghosts. Seriously, immerse yourself in excavating here though, surrounded by 160 mummies deep in the earth, curses and condemnations? Nah. How about a recent discovery that shows us there's still so much out there? The Notre Dame tombs. This month, four years ago, pause. 2019 was four years ago. Let me sit with that for a second. Whew, okay, well, in April of 2019, many of us opened our phones or turned on our TVs to a massive shock. The Notre Dame was burning. The 12th century Gothic cathedral was saved by 500 plus firefighters, but had a major structural damage. French authorities call an archaeologist to help make sense of the damage and how to start repairs. They find something else. Two coffins, sculptures, statues, and unseen architecture. After months of research and scans, they figure out one identity because it turns out to be written on the outside the whole time. Antoine de Pelaporte high priest who died in 1710 at 83. In the 300 years since he was buried, his coffin was damaged and allowed air to enter, so he was mostly bones and some bits of hair instead of a mummy. The other coffin is Mr. Unknown, and he's rocking mummy vibes. Check him out. He died between ages 25 and 40 from TB, and his pelvic bone region suggests he was a horseback rider. To be buried in the Notre, he's obviously an aristocrat, and he was buried with a flower crown, which is super cute. Both men were buried in lead sarcophagi, which was a practice reserved for the elite. Still, the two Coffins are also quite different from each other, and this shocking find tells us the Notre is still full of secrets to uncover. And if there's two, they're safe to assume there's more. A Grecian cemetery holds terrible secrets at the bottom of a well. The Carmico Cemetery dates all the way back to the Bronze Age, so around 2700 BCE. It was first excavated by archaeologists in 1870, and since 1930, excavations have continued and thousands of tombs uncovered. As you can imagine, through years of excavations, lots of messed up things have been discovered in said tombs. Weird bodies, weird deaths, buried alive, and now in 2020, a collection of 30 inscribed lead tablets were found at the bottom of a well that's 2,500 years old. Which sounds creepy enough as is, but the tablets each bear individual curses and prayers to Greek gods of the underworld, aka it's like Grecian culty Satanism stuff, as well as the fact that the well was poisoned and in the middle of a tomb yard. Judge Strokozak, who led the excavation, said that whoever ordered the curses inscribed on the tablets was unnamed, but the black magic is present and therefore all to see, even if forbidden in Greece at the time. And while the well was only just found in 2016, as mentioned, the site was first excavated in 1870. But progress halted when World War II broke out, as all members of the excavation team joined the forces. And then every single one died back to back to back. While it's hard to pin that on the curse itself, it does follow the trend set by King Tut and Casimir.
here. A recent discovery changes the history of the Philippines. The lost Melania tombs. Our world still has discoveries to be made, and archaeologists have proven that when they unearthed the remnants of a thousand year old village on a jungle mountaintop in the Philippines. I'd say this is more of a shocking tomb discovery than scary. I'm just excited about this. The game changer is the discovery of limestone coffins, a type that's never been found before in Southeast Asia. This is huge because it's the first indication that Filipinos at the time in history practiced more advanced burial rituals than previously thought, and that they had metal tools to carve these coffins, which we didn't know before. While they're similar to ancient sarcophagi, the tombs differ by being simple, without elaborate decoration or images on the tops or sides. They're just a plain, classy box. And a tooth extracted from one of the skeletons, carbon data confirmed they are about a thousand years old, with 15 graves found in total. Overall, this site is described as a complex archaeological site with both habitation and burial remains from a period of approximately 10th to 14th century. It's the first kind in the Philippines having these limestone advancements. Mulaney tourism officer Sammy Cortez says after the archaeologists have finished their work, they're going to open this up as an archaeological site you can visit, the same as the Tut's tomb. For my Twilight fans, you may get your kissing a vampire fantasy, seeing as there are vampire graves in Bulgaria. And it's not even like one, there's a couple. Archaeologists in Bulgaria have uncovered a 13th century corpse at Perpopikion, an ancient Thradican site in the south of the country, belonging to a man in his 40s who had the misfortune of a big ol' iron rod stomped through his ribcage with the purpose of keeping the corpse from rising from the dead and disturbing the living. Oh, and his left leg had also been removed and placed next to the corpse. Insult to injury, they're making sure he can't go anywhere. At the time of the man's death, vampires were perceived as a real threat in many Eastern European and Balkan communities. People who died usually from things like taking their own lives or being fine one day and dying the next in their sleep, for example, were sometimes staked to prevent them coming back from the dead because it was an unnatural death. Amongst the Romani people, anyone who was missing a finger or had an appendage similar to those of an animal or had a horrible appearance, yikes if you're ugly, was regarded as someone who is dead. In Russia, those who talked to themselves were suspected of being a vampire in nature. So I guess I might be a vampire because that's essentially kind of what I'm doing right now, isn't it? To date, nearly 100 skeletons have been found across Bulgaria, nailed into their coffin with iron stakes or with heavy bricks and stones placed in open mouths. As I've mentioned in many of my recent demon and ghost videos, if multiple cultures report the same creature and the same method of execution for the thing, even before meeting each other, I'm inclined to maybe believe this was real. This tomb hides dirty laundry and family secrets. The New Grange and Douth tombs. It starts with a dirty story. 11th century Meath County, Ireland, a salacious folktale is passed down for 4,000 years, saying an ancient king who hailed from the tribe of the gods did some stuff with his sister on the winter solstice as part of magical ritual to restart the sun's daily cycle and save the world from endless night. Supposedly, the deed was done in one of the country's huge burial mounds, which the locals have named the Hill of Sin. The hill is now called Douth Passage, a close neighbor and connected to the New Grange Passage. Its entries are marked with large stones, and on every winter solstice, the sun shines through and lights up the innermost burial chamber. This is supposed to be the result of the magical act that the king performed there. And nearly a thousand years after the local legend was first written down, ancient DNA suggested discovery that at least part of the story, naturally the grossest part, was actually true. See, the New Grain Passage is a tomb of over 150 kilometers for a well-connected family according to an ancient DNA analysis. Like a prehistoric version of the Habsburgs, this extended group of relatives seems to have ruled Ireland and maintained its connected dynasties for centuries within the family. Rulers only tend to marry their siblings in societies where the king is actually considered a god, whose perceived divinity exempts them from social custom. The winter solstice claim probably helped these rulers support their godly claim and rally effort it took to move 200,000 tons of rock to build a passage like the New Grange. That's something the pharaohs of Egypt, the kings of pre-colonial Hawaii, and the Inca emperors had in common. This cave tomb discovery is a new breed of human. Homo floriansiasis. Once upon a time, on the isolated Isle of Flores, Indonesia, there lived a colony of little people. Very little people. Liang Pananing is a cave on the island of Sulawesi that is part of an island grouping called Wallachia, which ancient humans traveled through at least 50,000 years ago as a meeting point for the major admixture mating event between the Denisovoans and the modern humans on their initial journey to Oceania. Here, anthropologists find seven remains of three foot tall humans with brains the size of grapefruits, suggesting these 18,000 year old specimens weren't a quirk of ancient homo hominin, but rather an entire species of miniature people who existed and overlapped with modern homo sapiens. Although the odd little humans likely 
left no descendants, and therefore no mark on human biology now, scientists say this is the first documentation of an entirely new species of Homo ninens that apparently adapted and lived for thousands thousands of years in caves on the isolated island. As for their size, their limited habitat and its hot humid conditions may have been the key factors. They may have arrived on the island as African or Asian Homo erectus and their generation shrank over time. Genetic size adaption would make sense for survival. Similar factors were also at play for the pint-sized stegodon elephant, whose remains were also found in the cave with the tiny people. Evidence suggests that they hunted the miniature elephant-like creatures in groups. Imagine being the person who uncovers a tiny race of humans. Now that is a discovery, and I'm going to be keeping up to date with this one. In 10th place, we have Unsinkable Sam. I thought I'd start off the list with something sort of fluffy. And what's better for that than a very good kitty? The black and white cat was originally named Oscar and started his career in the fleet of the Yahtzee regime, the Kriegsmarine, and ended it in the Royal Navy. He was on board the Bismarck, the HMS Cossack, and the HMS Ark Royal. All three of those ships had a single thing in common, and yep. They sank, and this kitty survived them all. Originally on the Bismarck, only 118 humans from its crew of over 2,200 survived. Little Oscar was found floating on a board and picked up from the water, the only survivor to be rescued by the British destroyer, HMS Kozak. For a few months, all went smoothly, until sadly the ship was hit by a torpedo, and once again, the precious kitty was found clinging to a piece of plank. He made it through the ordeal and was brought to the shore establishment in Gibraltar. Unsinkable Sam was then adopted by the crew of the HMS Ark Royal, which ironically was a ship that was instrumental in sinking the Bismarck. Ark Royal survived several near misses and gained a reputation as a lucky ship, a fitting home for the lucky kitty. The Germans incorrectly reported the ship as sunk on multiple occasions, but the luck didn't last and were Returning from Malta on November 14th of 1941, this ship too was uh, torpedoed. This time, Sam was found clinging to a floating plank by a motor launch and described as angry but unharmed. At this point, Sam had enough of sea life. He was transferred to a job on land and spent the rest of his days hunting mice in the building of the Governor General. In ninth place, time to visit the London Zoo. So in the late 30s, everyone sort of knew war was coming and prepared accordingly, and the London Zoo in particular was no exception. War broke out on September 3rd of 1939, and at precisely 11 a.m., the zoological gardens were closed by order of the government, as were all other public places where people gathered in large numbers. Zoo records show that some of the zoo's most valuable animals were transferred to Whipsnade for safety, including two giant pandas, two orangutans, four chimpanzees, three Asian elephants, and an ostrich. That's almost a Christmas carol. <laughs> Here's the sad part though. All of the venomous animals were killed to remove the possibility of having dangerous animals escape the zoo if the zoo were, um, kaboomed. However, some reptiles were saved, among them the Komodo dragon and Chinese alligators. Two large wooden boxes around 8 feet long by 4 feet wide and 2 feet deep were built to accommodate two huge pythons, one 28 feet long and the other 25 feet long. The most valuable fish were kept and housed in tubs and tanks in the tortoise house, where the glass was crisscrossed with sticky tape to prevent it from, well, shattering. In 8th place, we have Kasai's Castle. Sitting on a gorgeous wooded hilltop in Walbrich in southwest Poland, Kasai's Castle was seized by the Yahtzees from the royals in 1941 as their evil leader's future residence. A maze of tunnels and bunkers were built using forced labor from the nearby Gross Rosen concentration camp, but the complex was not completed at the end of the war. Some say that the complex was the headquarters of the Yahtzee command. Others believe that the tunnels might have housed an arms factory or a nuclear weapons laboratory. Let me know in the comments what you think it would have housed. In seventh place, we have the Amber Room. The incredible Amber Room was considered to be the eighth wonder of the world and was a gift to Peter the Great to celebrate peace between Russia and Prussia in 1716. Try saying that five times fast. It was created in Prussia and the construction began in 1701, but when Peter saw the room and expressed his admiration, King Frederick William I offered it as a gift and had it shipped to St. Petersburg in 18 boxes. Tsarina Elizabeth moved the room again, this time to the Catherine Palace in Pushkin in 1755. The already impressive the impressive room was expanded and renovated, and when completed, it covered 55 square meters and contained approximately 13,000 pounds of amber and other valuables. The amber panels were adorned with gold leaf, and historians believe the room was worth about 400 million in today's money. When Schmittler initiated Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the um, Soviet Union, on June 22nd of 1941, approximately 3 million soldiers entered the USSR. When the marauding German army entered Pushkin, the curators of the Catherine Palace desperately tried to disassemble and hide the precious Amber Room. But the Germans found it. 
tore it down within 36 hours and shipped it to Kaliningrad in 27 crates. In late 1943, the curator of the museum where it was being held was told to dismantle the Amber Room yet again and store it elsewhere. The city was kaboomed by the alleys in August of 1944, and the whereabouts of the room are still unknown. Theories from historians vary, with one saying the museum curator didn't follow orders, so it was destroyed in the big kaboom, while another theory is that the amber was loaded onto a ship and is located at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Apparently there's a curse on the amber room as well, seeing as a number of people connected with it have met untimely deaths. The museum curator and his wife died from typhus, while a Russian intelligence officer died in a car crash immediately after talking about the Amber Room to a journalist. So if you never see me again, you know why. In sixth place we have a ghost plane. Couldn't help myself, had to talk about ghosts at some point today. Our tale takes place on December 8th of 1942, which was a year and a day after the attack on Pearl Harbor that was what brought the United States into, you know, the war. The American Navy was on duty at Pearl Harbor, when suddenly, its radar picked up an odd reading. It seemed as if a lone plane was making its way from Japan and heading right into American airspace. It was late at night, and the sky was overcast. Previous attacks had never occurred under those conditions. The radar operators were rightfully puzzled, but they sent two pilots to intercept the craft since they were not taking any chances. When they reached the plane, the pilots were shocked to find out that it was a P-40 with markings that hadn't been used since that attack. Once they got near the plane, they found that it had been shot to pieces and its landing gear was destroyed. They also saw the plane's pilot slumped over the cockpit with his suit stained by fresh red uh, fluid. Incredibly, the pilot moved slightly, smiling and waving at the Americans. The plane plummeted to the ground and crashed in a field. When the two pilots investigated the crash site, they found the wreckage, but no sign of the pilot. The search team also found a diary that showed that the plane was stationed in Mindanao, approximately 1,300 miles away. The lack of landing gear made it an extremely difficult mystery to solve, and still has not been solved. How could a pilot survive the attack on Pearl Harbor for a year? Also, how did he manage to land and take off with no landing gear? I guess we'll never know. In fifth place, we have an airman who crashed and survived. Nicholas Alchemade was born in 1922 in Norfolk, England, and was a gardener before signing up with the Royal Air Force when the Second World War broke out. He was part of a crew that flew an Avro Lancaster MK2, which often flew night missions, and as such was christened Werewolf. Kind of funny. Nicholas flew 14 successful missions with the crew of Werewolf, and on the night of March 24th of 1944, they were part of a raid targeting Berlin. They managed to successfully deliver their payload, but on the return journey, heavy winds took them, of course. They wound up flying over the Ruhr region, which had a high concentration of anti-aircraft defenses. Werewolf was attacked from below by a German night fighter aircraft, and the resulting damage tore up Werewolf's wing and fuselage, setting the plane on fire. It's kind of obvious that the Werewolf was beyond salvation, and the pilot ordered the crew to uh, get the heck out. Now Nicholas, alone in his turret at the very back of the plane, was already being scorched by the flames. With his rubber oxygen mask beginning to melt to his face, his arms were completely seared by the fire, so he was scrambling for his parachute pack and discovered that it was uh, already on fire. Nicholas was now facing a fun dilemma. Either burn to death or take his chances and jump without a parachute. Well, he jumped from the burning plane, lost consciousness, and miraculously woke up three hours later, lying deep in the snow in a pine forest. It seems that the flexible pine trees had slowed his descent enough that the snow was able to cushion his fall. He had not broken any bones, but had managed to sprain his knee after, you know, his 18,000 foot fall from the sky. In addition, he suffered burn wounds from the fire and had pieces of perspex from his flax shattered screen embedded in his skin. That's a dang miracle if I've ever seen one. He began blowing his distress whistle, which eventually attracted the attention of some German civilians. Nicholas was taken to a nearby hospital where his wounds were treated, and when he was well enough to talk, he was interrogated by the Gestapo. Even after they proved his story was true, and you know, he wasn't a spy, he was sent to the notorious prison camp, Stalag Luft III. Nicholas's luck remained with him though. When the camp's 10,000 inmates were forced to trek hundreds of miles across northern Germany through a blizzard with temperatures dropping as low as minus 22, he survived and was eventually liberated. As my grandpa would say, he was born with a horseshoe up his Come on, can't I at least say that word? No? Alrighty, up to you folks to finish that sentence.
In fourth place, we have explosive devices that are still being found. For context, between 1940 and 1945, US and British Air Forces dropped 2.7 million tons of kabooms on Europe and half that amount on Germany. Under Allied occupation in 1945, reconstruction of what had been destroyed began almost immediately. Yet as many as 10% of the explosives dropped by Allied aircrafts had failed to explode. And as East and West Germany rose from the ruins, thousands of tons of unexploded airborne ordnance lay beneath them. In both the East and the West, responsibility for defusing these devices, along with removing the innumerable hand grenades, bullets, and mortar and artillery shells left behind at the end of the war, fell to specialty police technicians and firefighters known as the KMBD. Y'all don't want to know how many times I tried to say the long form and just, with my brain, it not happening. Sorry. More than 2,000 tons of unexploded munitions are uncovered on German soil every year before any construction project begins in Germany, from like, you know, simply the extension of a home to track laying by the National Railroad Authority, the ground must be certified as cleared of unexploded ordnance. Oh, someone out there finds this far-fetched. Okay. In November of 2013, 20,000 people in Dortmund were evacuated while experts defused a 4,000 pound blockbuster device that could destroy, well, you know, most of a city block. Specialists discover more than 500 tons of unexploded munitions every year and defuse an aerial device every two weeks or so. Did that make your doubts go away? I had a feeling it might. In third place, we have the Museum of a Forgotten Race. After winning the war and achieving their overarching goal of wiping out the Jewish people in Europe, the Yazis originally intended to open a museum that would commit a second genocide and depict the Jews as a people who had to be exterminated because they were a decadent and parasitical race. Which is allegedly why the Yahtzees were holding on to a centuries old collection of Jewish artifacts in Prague. Over 85 Jewish people had their lives ended at the Natzweiler Struthoff concentration camp in France to serve as part of an initiative of Yahtzee anthropologists and doctors to dissect and display their bodies in a museum collection dedicated to the supposed inferiority of the eventual extinct race of Jewish people. Modern anthropologists have discovered collections of limbs stored with the intention of being displayed and catalogued. Thank goodness this never came to fruition. In second place, we have some uses for hair and human ashes. It's no secret what went on at concentration camps, with tales of the gas chambers being way too many. Something that doesn't get touched on as much was that when the gas cleared, groups of inmates would shift the corpses, pull out any gold teeth, and shave hair. These men, known as Sonder Commando, were better fed and worked at their grisly tasks for three to four months before meeting their own end since uh, they knew too much. The hair was stored in a room above furnaces to keep it warm in the piercing cold of any Polish winter. No such luxury was permitted for the camp's inhabitants, but the hair was worth something, around half a mark a kilo. The textile industry used human hair to line socks and gloves for submarine and railway workers and make thermal blankets. I guess there's kind of like a grim efficiency about it. The human ash from furnaces was stored in four purpose-built pits, which remain today from where it was taken to be spread on local farmers' fields to help with the crops. In first place, we have the experiments of Dr. Joseph Mengele. Also known as the Angel of Death, Dr. Joseph was an anthropologist and SS physician who conducted numerous inhumane medical experiments on the prisoners in Auschwitz. He was particularly interested in twins as twin research was seen at the time to be the ideal way to determine how the environment or human heredity could influence the human body. He would attempt red fluid transfusions from one twin to another, do amputations to try and sew it on the other twin, stitch two twins together to form Siamese twins, infect one twin with any kind of disease, and too many other experiments. To the surprise of no one, more often than not, the twins died during the procedures, or he would have them killed afterwards just so he could do an autopsy. If one twin died from disease, he would often end the life of the other as well to, you know, study the differences between the sick and healthy subjects. The evil doctor was also very interested in heterochromia, where people have irises of different colors, and he would collect eyes and body parts of his victims and send it through for research? He would inject chemicals in victims' eyes to attempt to change their eye color. He also experimented on pregnant women before sending them off to the gas chambers and caused incestuous pregnancies, always under the guise of, yeah, research. Oh, and operating on victims without anesthesia. Oh, and if that wasn't, you know, disgusting enough, he tried to prove that Jewish and Romani people were genetically inferior through his morbid experimentation. And now that my stomach is turning, that's the end of our scary stories for today. If you made it this far, congratulations! I'm sure I'll be reliving parts of this in my nightmares tonight. I'm gonna start in my usual fashion by choosing someone that may be familiar to all of us, such as Caligula. Roman Emperor Caligula ruled for only four years, from AD 37 to 41. When he first assumed 
assumed power, he was a pretty alright guy. He allowed exiles to return to Rome, eliminated unpopular tax, and put in place some political reforms that citizens supported. But in no time, he became notoriously deranged and sadistic. The best of both worlds. He forced a political rival to take their life, made senators run in front of his chariot for miles, threw spectators into the arena to be killed by animals, forced himself upon wives and daughters of senators, and he could not keep his hands off his sister Drusella. Once, when presiding over the sacrifice of a bull, instead of bringing the hammer down on the animals, Cranium Caligula deliberately did it to the priest's assistant. Some of his cruelties were more capricious and arbitrary in nature. He would order that the awnings providing shade for the crowds of public entertainment be pulled back at the hottest times of the day. And if he ran across a man with a thick head of hair, he'd have him seized on the spot and his scalp roughly shaven because Caligula was going bald. His reign came to an end when his own guards killed him, the first Roman emperor to die this way. Another recognizable face and name may be that of Bloody Mary, not the mirror one from the 90s sleepovers. I'm talking Mary from first of England, as in the first queen of England. She could have been remembered for that, but instead it's her attempts to restore Catholic only England using convert or die policy that she's remembered for. Lady Jane Grey, who Mary had put to death to gain the throne, was more likable to the public. Protestants detested Mary and feared England being reclaimed in the name of Catholicism. Mary promised not to force conversion and that her upcoming marriage to the Catholic Spanish king wouldn't sway her. Womp womp, bloody B word is a liar. A month into her ascension, Mary reaffirmed the papal jurisdiction over England, and when the deal with Rome succeeded, the heresy acts were reinstated, which allowed for the burning of heretics. In February of 1555, the Marian persecutions began. Sources vary, but in total, Mary I had almost 300 people executed, most of them burned at the stake. Most of them simply for the crime of being Protestant. Her reign was relatively short, lasting a little over five years. She died in 1558, either from ovarian cysts or cancer. Next up is the toll taking Ptolemy Philopater, one of the Greek kings of the Hellenistic Egypt, a very obvious descendant of Alexander's pal Ptolemy. He was a third century BCE pharaoh and a drunk hot mess. In true Egyptian fashion, he married his sister Arsinio and deified himself while he was still alive, promoting his family's association with Egyptian and Greek gods. In order to keep his throne secure, he did what any Ptolemy did best kill every family member within grabbing distance. Ptolemy killed his mother, brother, and uncle with the assistance of a guy named Sobiesis, who was pals with a fellow named Agatholakis, whose sister Agatholaclea was banging Ptolemy. In addition to sneaking around with the sisters of his homies, which is not very for the boys of him, Ptolemy lounged around as if his chief concern were the idle pomp of royalty. He stopped paying attention to domestic and foreign affairs, devoting himself to shameful amours and senseless and constant drunkenness. He was compared to Dionysus, the god of drunkenness and tragedy. Neglecting his royal duties, Ptolemy even took up the pen writing a tragedy called Adonis. Unsurprisingly, it was under Ptolemy that Egypt's international presence began to wane. Next up is the Liu Song Emperor gone wrong. This teenage Chinese emperor only ruled for one year in the 5th century, but what a legacy he left. Liu Ziye was the eldest son of Emperor Xiao of Liu Song during the southern and northern dynasties, and he took over the throne as Emperor Qiafin when he was 15 years old, against the wishes of his father who had died, who'd wanted Liu's younger brother, Ziluan, to ascend to the throne next. Once it was his, Liu, out of deep resentment towards said father and brother, immediately forced his brother to take his own life and killed all his other siblings. The new emperor also slaughtered all of the officials who'd worked for his dad and put his uncles under house arrest to avoid coups. While he's at it, he summoned his aunt to his palace to satisfy his uncommon bedroom desires and then killed his uncle when the man couldn't stand what happened to his wife. He tormented his own concubines, forced horrible situations with inanimate objects and animals, and he also had a very consensual reoccurring relation with his sister in the palace. When said sister complained it was unfair that Liu had so many concubines and she only had one husband, Liu selected several dozen handsome men to act as her concubines. But Liu's worst fear ends up being true. His uncles had plotted against him and one night, almost a year to the day since he had taken the throne, Liu Ziye went to the pavilion of one of his parks at night and shot at ghosts a shaman told him were hanging around. Distracted by shooting at ghosts, he let his courtiers get close and kill him. Now onto Nero the Nutcase. He became the Roman Emperor when he was 17, the youngest ever at that time, and it's clear Nero got his Machiavellian inclinations from 
his mother, who ensured his place on the throne by marrying her weird old uncle and then killing him via poison. Nero's hedonism actually continually got the best of him. In fact, he sentenced or personally killed most of his close relatives. For example, Nero slept with and killed his mother, married and death sentenced one stepsister, death sentenced his other stepsister, forced himself upon and then killed his stepbrother. He kicked his wife to death, then met a young man who looked like her, so he had the guy's boy snipped, dressed him up to look like the dead wife, and married the guy. He married another random dude, this time Nero himself playing the bride, and Nero also told Seneca, THE Seneca, to F off and take his own life, which he did. And that's just the creepy lusty stuff. In 64 AD, a great fire struck Rome, taking out 75% of the city. Many Romans blame Nero himself for the fire as a way to make room for a new castle, which he then built where half of Rome used to be. Even if he didn't start it, he did nothing to stop it, instead blaming Christians. Under his rule, thousands of Christians were starved to death, burned, torn by dogs, fed to lions, crucified, used as human torture and nailed to crosses. He was so bad that many of these Christians thought he was the Antichrist. Some regard her as a hero, but she was a through and through bigot. Isabella of Castile. There was supposed to be a little chance, little, that she would ever become a monarch of the Castiles, as she was super far removed from the direct royal lineage. Isabella is even promised to a commoner to end a rebellion. Thankfully for her, he dies before that happens. She was then wed to Ferdinand, the heir of the thrones of Castile and Aragon. And after the death of the king of Castile, Steel, the throne was given to Isabella, but there were some counterclaims and four years of battles before she is fully titled Queen of Castile. Her cruelty is recognized in the treatment of non-Christians. Her kingdom's Muslims, and especially Jewish people, were the victims of a horrible mass slaying. Her actions led to the formation of the Spanish Inquisition, known for its extreme brutality and non-Catholics, and the massive erasure of history, racial diversity, and culture worldwide. Isabella and Ferdinand then annexed the Kingdom of Grandana, the last Muslim kingdom in Spain, and the last piece to fall to the Spanish Reconquista. While some may see it as a liberation of Spain, for literally everyone else, this was the big G word, including the UN, if you look at their definition. Our next one is the formidable founder, King Leopold II, who founded the Congo Free State as his own private colony and went on to make a huge fortune from it by forcing the Congolese into heavy unpaid labor for ivory and rubber. This evil Belgian king was dubbed the Satan and Mammon in one person as he ran around kickstarting Europe's so-called scramble for Africa in 1880s. He convinced the world that his violently ceased and lucratively priced land grab in the Congo was humanitarian, telling Euro and American powers he was the only in Africa to save the poor people from the era people and bring Christianity to a dark continent. Effin liar! Instead he stole about 1.1 billion to fund his lavish lifestyle and fund an array of uncomfortably young girlfriends, one of which he married when he was 74 and then died five days later. And the Congo? He turned into a massive labor force. Millions end up suffering from starvation, the birth rate dropped as men and women were separated, and tens of thousands are killed in failed rebellions. Demographers estimate that from 1880 to 1920 the population population fell by 50%. This forced labor system was then copied by French, German, and Portuguese officials. He called himself Laglium Dei, aka the Scourge of God. For Roman historian Jordanes, he was a man born into the world to shake the nations. For the Romans themselves, he was a savage destroyer, of whom it was said that the grass never grew on the spot where his horse had trod. Who was this man? Attilia of the Huns. This ruthless king of the nomadic Asiatic race killed his brother to take the throne before embarking on a campaign of slaughter and pillage through a hundred cities, which took him to the gates of Constantinople, Troyes and Gaul, and even Rome itself, threatening their empire into paying them off once a year to not be invaded by them. The Huns were interested in grabbing people, animals, loot, and land. They destroyed food sources for their enemies, and nobody was safe from their wrath, including women, elderly, priests, monks, and nuns. When marauding through Eastern Europe one day, Attila and his forces wiped 70 cities off the map. The Huns Hun's fighters were known to make blood-curdling screams and other noises while attacking their victims on horseback, and their favored methods of death were impalement and crucifixion. Meeting time with our mad queen of Madagascar, Rana Valona makes it to the throne when her father warns the king of the United Tribes that someone was planning an attempt on his life. Grateful for the warning, he adopts Rana into his court one day to be the wife of his son, Prince Radama. Fast forward, the king passes in 1810 and the Prince Radama takes the throne with Rana as his queen. He allowed for an invasion on the land, especially by British missionaries who built buildings of their own and help 
develop written language and force Christian conversion naturally. These modernized ideas displeased Rana, so when her husband died and she wanted the throne, she figured, hey, these guys are kind of stupid. And by just claiming that God said she should be the queen, everyone dropped what they were doing and let her ascend to the throne. Just like that. She expelled any and all Europeans immediately and canceled trade deals with Britain and France. After one successful battle against an invasion, she stuck the missionaries' heads on spikes along the shoreline to really get the message across. She replaced the trial by jury with trial by ordeal, and those found guilty alongside with other criminals and prisoners are sold to Europeans. In 1845, Rana ordered 50,000 of her subjects to go on a buffalo hunt. With a small amount of supplies and having to build a road on their way to ease the trap as per her order. Only 10,000 of them returned, and they never caught any buffalo. Consequently, Rana's reign brought down the nation's population from 5 million to around 2.5 million by the end of her rule. On August 16th of 1861, Rana died at the age of 79 during her sleep in the palace. People mourned her death in great honor for approximately 9 months. And to take the cake is the terrifying Timur. Also known as Tamerlane, this Mongol Turkic conqueror was born in 1330. Timur became a criminal early in life, stealing goods and animals from travelers, later working as a mercenary. As a conqueror, he killed for loot, personal glory, and the dark joy that twisted up up people get from inflicting pain on others. He was the worst of the least recognized psychopaths in history, and his story provides a lesson and a warning for all of humanity. And he has a long list of horrible deeds. Dude could probably have his own top 10 video, I swear. Like the invasion of Ifshafan, which went well, and the city surrendered, but some teenage idiots decided they didn't like that and they had never done that before, so they killed a couple of Timur's men. So, Timur had a city of 70,000 to about 100,000 people beheaded in response. From this moment onwards, skull towers became his operandi, and it was proven in Baghdad when 90,000 skulls were erected into 120 stinking towers throughout the city. In present day Afghanistan, Timur ordered the construction of a tower to be made out of live men, each stacked on each other, then cemented together with bricks and mortar. And as much as it's relevant for atrocities, talking about Damascus would make me sick, so let's just say his crimes in there earned him the status as an official enemy of Islam from the Muslim leaders at the time. And he was a self-proclaimed Muslim guy. This guy quite literally put the once great Sultan of the Ottoman Empire into a footstool that he would climb on to get onto his horses. And that's how we got the name for the Ottoman, the stupid little furniture piece that's impossible to place in your living room correctly. In the end, Timur's armies are estimated to have killed 17 million people, approximately 5% of the world population at the time. Kicking off the list at number 10, accidental science, aka the discovery of penicillin. Sometimes miracles happen when nobody's looking. Alexander Fleming first discovered penicillin back in 1928. At the time, he was actually studying Staphylococcus, which is a bacteria that causes infections and boils, all that nasty stuff. But right before Alexander left for a two week vacation, he left a petri dish with some of that Staphylococcus on the lab table rather than storing it away in an incubator. During this well needed time off, a penicillium mold spore just drifted in there, either through a window or the lab door, some Horton Here's a Who adventure. This tiny speck was well on its way it was the perfect conditions for a spore flight. The temperature of the room wasn't too breezy, and the lack of one Alexander Fleming allowed time for the mold to fight back and prevent that bacteria from growing any further. He discovered this antibacterial substance was only produced by strains of penicillium. Yeah, the guy accidentally creates penicillin on his time off. What a great time. The 20s were an odd but brilliant time. Number nine, prohibition. It's a law that puts fear into wine drinking moms and beer drinking dads across the nation. For there was a time when the sale and consumption of alcohol was banned. That means it was a dry country, not one drop to be had. Except for those uh, found in loopholes and all the other crazy loopholes in the system. And by that, I actually mean organized crime filling the shoes of breweries and other openings like uh, literal underground bars called speakeasies to keep the sauce flowing. You know what I mean. Now, to be fair, there was an issue with drinking back in the day, but there's a few issues with banning it as well. The first being that it was in high demand, like stupid high even before it was banned. So banning it basically gave a green light to bootleggers and criminals to make millions, and they did. And second, it was America's fifth largest industry, putting many out of work and dissolving a very large portion of tax revenue. No surprise it didn't work out. Number eight, the work week. 
Okay, seriously, who do we have to talk to? Who do we have to blame for having to work nine to five, Monday to Friday? Dolly Parton has a groovy tune about it, but when did the 40 hour work week start? Well, 1926 is your answer. The Ford Motor Company of all companies. Yeah, who do you think? They were the first to have factory workers clock in and out 40 hours a week with a weekend. Nice. Whereas before, you maybe had one day off, maybe, depending on what you were doing. Obviously more time to rest, eat, and clear your mind, maybe work out. This increased productivity, so it spread like wildfire. Cut to today, we're now advocating for a four day work week. We're getting greedy, I know. Shorter hours, same workload, apparently this is going well. Productivity is soaring. In Iceland, for example, 2,500 workers tested this four day work week. That's literally 1% of Iceland's population, so it worked. Pretty big test run. But now 86% of Iceland's workforce have shorter hours. It's great, seems like we're well on our way. So sorry, Mr. Ford, we're taking back our Fridays. Okay, number seven, Valentine's Day. Not the most romantic Valentine's Day ever, but maybe one of the most infamous. Back in 1929, organized crime was no joke. It was everywhere. Thanks to prohibition and a lot of corruption, it was the age of gangsters. However, one incident in 1929 changed things. On February 14th, 1929, seven gang members were deleted. This proved to be too much for the public at the time, and the final straw in a large string of violent crimes was up. Until this point, a lot of crooks and gangsters like Al Capone were idolized for the lavish lifestyles and ritzy and swanky nights in the town. This, however, was one step too far and helped to further reform and crime, giving a certain FBI predecessor to rise up and eventually found the FBI. The lesson here? Sure, being a gangster is great. Sign your autographs, live like a fat cat in your penthouse. But there's only so much you can get away with. After it was all said and done, Capone got put away too. And if they can get Capone, they can get you. Number six, the birth of brands. When it comes to advertisements, you can't even take the bus down the street without seeing hundreds of ads. I'll catch myself staring at a Sunwing ad for 43 minutes just so I can avoid eye contact with Johnny Jingle Keys in front of me. Even growing up, the amount of pop-ups I had to close really fast, my reflexes are so sharp now, all thanks to those gross pop-ups. And it all started 100 years ago. Huge brands began popping up in the 1920s with these fun slogans, big colorful ads. The 20s witnessed the birth of advertisements from Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, Hostess Cakes, Welch's, and of course, one of the most unforgettable, Kool-Aid. Yeah, the Kool-Aid man is 95 years old. Yeah, I bet his knees are starting to feel like glass, that's for sure. Other companies that popped at this time was CVS, the automobile industry, obviously, and two brothers in California named Walt and Roy Disney. Yeah, they had some startup cartoon studio. Not sure what happened there. Best of luck, guys, keep going. Hopefully they have a GoFundMe, maybe. Number five, the League of Nations. World War I, she was a little bit of a doozy. Unlike some wars, World War I actually changed a lot after it was said and done. Borders changed, lands on maps, empires fell, some rose. Political ideas changed and the history of Europe's future was sealed the second the ink dried on the Treaty of Versailles. After the nations who were involved with the war took stock of what happened and it was clear we could never let this happen again. So the League of Nations was created. Beta UN, if you will. The idea was simple, peace, disarmament, and to step in when such horrific things were to ever happen again. I'm sure they won't. Well, the planning didn't go very well, and when it was finished, the US ultimately didn't decide to join when they were one of the founding members. Oof. Mind you, the US had a different mindset on foreign wars back then, but they were still involved. The League dissolved shortly after the Second World War ended. Number four, flappers. What a fun word they've been. In August 1920, history was forever changed when the 19th Amendment was passed, finally giving women the right to vote. Now look, in a list of ridiculous events, I'm adding this because it took a ridiculously long time to happen. Yeah, a little twist there for you. At first you're like, what? Relax. We're working. This was post-World War I, when women were still working all these jobs, high-paying jobs, might I add. So now there's no way they're gonna let those go. There's momentum in the workforce. So come August 1920, American women got the right to vote officially. Then Margaret Sanger came along the same year, which led us to women's right to birth control. A lot of momentum. Like Big Ched mentioned earlier, prohibition ended legal alcohol sales, but with jazz and women's independence post-war on the rise, you couldn't stop all this momentum. Thus, the flapper girl was introduced to American slang. Yeah, smoking in public, drinking and dancing at jazz clubs, all things that were upsetting their Victorian lineage before them. Oh, you wanna dance to jazz and have fun post-war? How dare thou? You wanna show your calf? 
After working doubles during a war? How dare you? Put those caps away, put that out. Number three, the Russian Revolution. Revolution, comrades. The 1920s were a crazy time, man. And if you look at the history between the US and Russia, it's almost like a hero and a villain origin story. Okay, hear me out. World War I was a bad time for Russia. They dropped out in early 1918, shortly before the whole thing ended. Why? Because the communists were there to take over. That's just how it went. Russia went from a 300 year Romanov rule to communism within a few short years. Safe to say this was having a great effect on the already struggling nation. It seemed that the harder things got, the more communist Russia got. When looking at the states after World War I, for the most part, it was a huge financial gain. And besides being the decade of gangsters and bootleggers, this was the start of many corporations and brands, like Taylor mentioned. It seemed as things got better and became more capitalist. Interesting indeed. Duality. Hmm. Number two, the Ponzi scheme. We've all heard the term Ponzi scheme at one point or another, but what does that even mean? Who is this man? Where can I find him? Ah, why are we so mad at him? Why is he scheming so often? Why? Who does that? A Ponzi scheme is, of course, a sham of an operation. It all kicks off back in the 1920s when one Italian immigrant named Charles Ponzi moved to the United States. He arrived to the States with the same goal as anyone, to work. That's it, just to work and you know, be successful. At first, he didn't have much luck, but eventually Charles was hired at Bank Zerosi. And when the bank sadly went bankrupt, Ponzi was SOL. He needed to do something and he needed to do something fast. So he dabbled into smuggling, but he got caught. After he was released, he went into the postal system, started to buy large quantities of postal coupons from countries with, you know, a weak economy, and then he hired a bunch of agents, trained them up good, you know, Wolf of Wall Street style, and the whole idea was that you would promise investors that they would receive double their investment back in return within 45 days. How lovely is that? Thus, the Ponzi scheme is born. Yeah, these agents got 10% commission too, which, as far as scams go, it's not too shabby. Not bad at all. Number one, Black Tuesday. Uh oh, stinky, the market crashed and now everyone's going broke. Big oof, right? Adam told me to say that, anyway. Yes, the great market crash of 29. It wasn't good. A mixture of outstanding loans, an already declining unemployment percentage, a struggling agriculture sector mixed in with a speck of low wages and stocks just not being worth what they were is the cause of the crash. By 1932, a lot of stocks were only worth 20% of what they originally were before. The stock market crash was not the main cause of the Great Depression, however, it was a symptom of it. The market wouldn't fully be back to normal until after FDR's New Deal, or realistically, when World War II had started and kicked America's, and really, the world's economy back into turbo mode. 